Well, welcome back everyone to day two of the 2021 Commuter Transportation Summit, um, the virtual edition. And I hope you, you all enjoyed that delicious lunch that we provided from Chipotle. Um, if you were not within a one mile uh, delivery radius of the local restaurant, then we regret we couldn't get you, our lunch, get you your lunch. But maybe you'll be able to use your voucher af after today's um, um, session for the, the uh, a sample of the shrimp sushi soft serve ice cream at Dairy Queen. It, it, it's yummy. It's really yummy. You wouldn't think so, but it's yummy. It's like putting bacon in things, you know, shrimp sushi. So when we left our panelists yesterday, we had covered the subjects of the immediate future of electric vehicles, um, refreshing your programs and marketing, where we are with telework and the post-pandemic workplace, the overview of district-wide Vanpool program, and I hope you all found something of interest in those topics. Today, uh, we have yours truly giving a snapshot of the Florida Commuter Assistance Program. Um, and then we'll hear about the neighborhood-based outreach program in District 5, um, how, transportation, how transportation systems will adapt to climate reality, and then the state, the town, and the private sector sounds like a spy novel or something. Um, and then Phil brings us up today on the recent research in TDM. And then we'll finish with the Travel Choice Awards, which I know you're all on pins and needles about, and the, and the acknowledgement of the Commuter Choice Certificate graduates for this year. And I go, and I hope that all of you find a nugget of information um, that's useful you know, in these presentations that's useful for your, for your programs. And for those of you who for some reason don't know me, choose not to know me, um, my name is Mike Wright and I'm the statewide commuter assistance program manager here at FDOT. And I'm, I've been in the transportation field since before the turn of the century. So how does that sound? And with that, we will, um, I will move forward into the, oh, do we have a poll. Do we have poll results? Okay. We asked you, what type of organization do you re represent? And 33% of you said commuter assistant programs are TMO. Um, state agency, uh, federal, wow, we have one person from a federal government agency, private business, a nonprofit, university, local government, and others. So local government, that's 16%. Huh, interesting. So, um, Oh, and here are um, some little housekeeping things here. Best ways to interact with one another during the summit. We thought that even though most of you probably know these things, we want just to let you know. Uh, feel free to chat with each other in the chat box, you know, talk amongst yourselves and I won't even give you a topic item to talk about. Uh, hopefully it's a, the topic is whatever we're talking about in the presentation. Um, add your questions for the presenter in the Q&A box and feel free to answer questions in the Q&A box if you perhaps know the answer. And raise your hand, and Christine wanted me to make sure it's not your hand because we don't see you, only the Romanians can see you through your camera. Um, raise your hand, the little hand on the icon at the bottom of your screen there. And if you want to unmute and to speak for some reason, if you think if you have something really, you know, earth shattering and life changing that you wanna share with all of us. Um, and some of you probably do have some of those things. <clears throat> so with that, I would like to talk about the state of the Florida Commuter Assistance Program. Well, you know, we have managed to come through this far in the pandemic relatively unscathed. Wait, wait, wait. Len says, are we supposed to put our agencies in chat so you know? Um, no. I don't think so, no. Um, we have managed to come through this far in the pandemic relatively unscathed as far as the commuter assistance program. In a state like Florida where our population continues to grow, there's no way we can build out of congestion. So it's up to our programs to help the residents find the tra travel options available to them that work the best for them. That is why we're trying to articulate a transit mobility vision up here in the central office. <clears throat> um, we're just taking the lead. It's not it's gonna be mandated from central office. We're trying to develop a mobility vision that will take into account all the modes available to the residents of Florida. 
We have to develop a real multimodal transportation network to maximize the effectiveness of our network. And sometimes it'll be a mix of options over the course of a week or a month, like we uh, heard yesterday on the topic of teleworking. It's not an all or nothing issue. The development of hybrid schedules that allow for a mix of time in the office and that and a remote location is going to be probably be the become the norm for <clears throat> most offices. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And with that, perhaps the commute on those in office days could be by transit or carpool or, or bike. I mean, the, the, we're, we're kind of on the precipice of the unknown in a way of what the future um, work population will be doing as far as their location. And um, we need to be kind of angling ourselves to be ready to um, deliver our message. Because we're not trying to convert anyone or cast any villains in, in the commuter assistance um, world. We are trying um, simply to help our residents efficiently and effectively use the resources that are, they have at their disposal. You know, we're trying to be educational and informational, not, not dogmatic and not judgmental. And um, in the process, we might help develop some new resources um, that increase their mobility options, you know, because you know, what's available in, in um, Tallahassee and, and um, Pensacola or, or in, in Fort Myers, um, you know, may not be what works in Miami and vice versa. Um, so we, we always have to be kind of ready to, to um, uh, find the tools and the mechanisms that work best in our community. <clears throat> our funding remains at the same levels, thank goodness, and so there shouldn't be any problems on that front. Our community assistance program is cover almost all of the state, and our goal is to make it 100% coverage. And, you know, we're, we're constantly working to, to do that. And if you check under your chairs, one of you has an envelope that impacts your funding. So it's kind of like, you know, Wheel of Fortune. It, it can either increase or decrease it by 10%. So if you choose to open it, so do you feel lucky? Um, so we'll see who the winner is um, or the loser. Some housekeeping. We are finally on the verge of an updated CAP procedure, Computer Assistance Program procedure, that will help guide the districts and programs in the development of their work plans and the execution of, of, of those plans and um, giving better guidance on how to use the money, what the money can be used for, and, and things like that. It'll be going out for um, uh, departmental review um, soon. Uh, my boss, Gabe Matthews, has told me it has to be in place before I retire next summer, but hopefully it'll be in place before the, the end of the fall. Oh, wait, the fall's almost here. Well, at least it'll be out for review before the end of the fall. And we are also re-examining the park and ride program. So for right now, um, we've put the allocation of funds on hold, except for um, one project that, that was in, in the works prior to to this, uh, to this development, because we're trying to find better ways to use the, the small amount of funds we get every year for park and rod. And um, we are trying to, we're, we're looking to find a way to orient the state program to smaller urban areas and rural areas where the, these funds could make a difference, could, could make a project viable that wouldn't have been viable and can introduce the whole concept of a park and ride um, in, in those parts of the state. You know, the urban areas, they, they, they're very well um, versed in park and ride and, and, the, and the facilities, and they have a myriad of funding sources that they can access for those, for those um, projects. Whereas when you get into the smaller areas, smaller urban areas, or, or even some of the bigger areas that they just have not really uh, utilized the program, that we would like to be to use the funds to to uh, jumpstart some projects in in those parts of the state. So we'll be we'll be developing those those um, those guidelines and um, sending it out to the districts, asking them to work with their agencies to develop some candidate projects for funding for next year. And then finally, I like to give a plug for the. Um, for the uh, technical assistance and training that we provide through our good friends at Cutter. 
And there is the commuter choice training certificate that gives uh, a very good background in the uses of transportation demand management and how that and, and provides many tools on how to effectively manage your, your commuter, commuter assistance program. Um, it, and it's available for free for those in Florida and for a nominal cost for those outside of Florida. It's, um, I would say it's useful for every, every newcomer into the program, especially at the district level, um, to sign up and, and work through the program. It, you, you know, you, if for some reason you can't finish the, the program in one year, try again the following year and make up, find the gaps that you, that you have to make up and um, work with Phil and his crew and, um, and they'll, they'll work you through it. But it, it's a very useful tool and it gives you a, a great background um, into um, what transportation man management is and what we can do with it for, for our communities. And then we also have the social marketing and transportation certificate. This is not terribly new, but it's still new for us. Um, social marketing is the systemic application of marketing along with other behavioral change concepts and techniques to achieve specific behavioral actions for a social purpose. You know, and that's what we do in commuter assistance with our with our outreach and stuff. We're trying to, like I said, we're, 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 not, we're not trying to be dogmatic, stuff, but we're trying to educate and, and motivate people to um, other choices, other options, things, things that, that they might have, might have considered just because one, they didn't understand how it worked, or, or two, they didn't think they, they really qualified to use that mode or to do for that option. Um, this certificate can help the transportation professionals who are looking to reduce congestion and improve access by increasing carpooling and transit ridership and are seeking <clears throat> to reduce pedestrian injuries and fatalities. This certificate will also provide you with a people-centered social marketing plan that relies on insight and understanding as much as, uh, as on data for creativity, design, and management of a program that, that, that strives for changes for good. So um, some might think, you know, it's manipulative, but it, but it is in a, in, 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 a, in a positive way. It's, like I said, trying to expand people's perceptions and knowledge. And um, with that, I am open to any questions before we go to our next session. Does anyone have any questions concerning the state of the Florida cap? We don't have any questions in the Q&A. I just reminded everyone to type in questions for Mike if they have any. Um, but we have a lot of chat going on. People are finding their uh, envelopes underneath their chairs, Mike, so. Oh, have they opened them? That's the question. <laughs> yes, that's, some are that's... happy and some are not. <laughs> <laughs> well, the ones that aren't happy, we'll give them an extra voucher for an extra uh, shrimp sushi ice cream soft serve. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, with no questions, I love that. Okay, because everyone is, must be terribly happy then. Our, our next um, presentation will be, um, is entitled, New Times, New Audiences. The, the 2020 Travel Choices Innovation Program Award went to District 5, which is Central Florida for those non-Floridians -Flor in, in, in this uh, presentation. And in, in, I mean, in today's session. Um, they won last year for the Neighborhood-Based Outreach Pilot Program. And, um, which focused on individual level marketing instead of employer focused efforts. The pilot program was prompted by data that showed that work trips account for only 20% of trips in Florida, leaving a large proportion of trips and travelers that are not reached through Rethink Your Commute, which is the, which is the um, commuter assistance program in central Florida, um, which had not reached through Rethink's program's employer-based offerings. Learn more about that work that went through into designing the neighborhood-based outreach program and the results of the, of the pilot program and explore ways to apply these lessons to, um, to your cat. And today's presenter will be uh, Courtney Reynolds. Courtney Reynolds um, has 17 years of experience in transit and transportation demand management. You know, she started when she was in high school. And, um, and as part of her role as a transportation planning manager for VHB, 
Courtney rejoined the management team for Rethink Your Commute, helping to reboot the program post-pandemic. Courtney serves as president of the board of the Florida Bicycle Association and enjoys teaching bike safety as, um, as, cycling savvy, as a cycling savvy instructor. And a little known fact about Courtney, um, before Courtney became a transportation guru that she, she is, she was in the production of Cats in a regional touring company in Southern Appalachia. She played the role of Jenny and Dots and um, many standing ovations in, 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 the, in the middle of the, of, the, of the play. And you can Google her and find a tape of her singing. It is a treat. And with that, Courtney. I think that might be better than the other things you may find if you Google me, but thank you guys. <laughs> uh, and um, I, I just want to say hi, Lynn and, and Mike. If Lynn wants to introduce herself, you should, everyone should go ahead and uh, pop in there uh, where you're from and, and your area of town. Um, I think we have a poll question associated with this, but uh, Christine or Julie, I don't know if we want to queue it up now. Uh, Courtney, we're having a, an error on the poll, so we may have to wait to do that after your presentation. We're trying to figure out the error code. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, I should have said nothing. So, well, um, well, hi everybody. My name is Courtney Reynolds, and as, as Mike described, apparently I'm a cast member of, of Cats. But uh, I, um, goodness, the the main thing to know about me is I I love the work that we get to do, um, and I have to acknowledge a lot of folks who. Uh, contributed hours, imagination, passion into the project that you're going to uh, hear about today. And so um, you'll see a number of the pictures of folks, but there were many contributors to this, including uh, Kelly Hogan Morphy, Amanda Day, Katie Clark, Erica Bierbauer, the list goes on and on, including uh, Lenina Dobson and Stephen Alianello um, with, with the previous team. So I just want to say this was definitely a team project. Uh, and also want to acknowledge Diane Poitras, who is our FDOT District 5 project manager, um, and she's uh, on the call today. So hi, Diane. Let's go to the next slide. So a little bit about Rethink Your Commute. Uh, we do promote smart transportation solutions for the region's workforce, which is just our a way of talking, uh, of uh, framing how we talk to people and what we talk to them about. We have been in existence since 2010. So, wow, Mike, uh, it, it's been a long time that, uh, that I've been watching you do these summits in person or otherwise. So we really focus on bringing together businesses and employees to explore all those shared benefits that we all know are out there of van pulling, car pulling, riding transit, biking, walking, and working from home. And ultimately we, uh, we see our program as strengthening our area's quality of life by decreasing traffic congestion, improving air quality, conserving natural resources. And as great as those things sound, I find that most people just uh, are, are sometimes more motivated by how they can save money by taking advantage of their transportation options. Thank you. Cool. So before the pandemic, remember that time, uh, as Mike described in, in the intro here, the Rethink Your Commute program really by design is focused on employers, sort of our initial audience. Um, so not just all employers, but where are the employers um, either facing challenges because of bottlenecks and congestion areas or the type of industry that they're in that they may be um, a better fit, their jobs may be a better fit for ride sharing, uh, transit, biking and walking and, and different things. I think that approach makes sense, especially when you have uh, limited resources. You don't want to just kind of go willy-nilly anybody uh, who, who will have you and invite you in. You want to make sure that there's a, a right mix of different factors where hopefully you can actually get success. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to try to not look at the chat. I'm glad you guys are talking. Um, what that ended up looking like for Central Florida is that we were talking to employment sites that were desk jobs, essentially, or shift work. Um, and it ended up being like nine to five um, in our central business district. And that was great. And, and man, we were busy. But the aha moment I started to have was due to the phone calls that we received to our 866-610 ride, the toll-free number. And so that number is on van pool vehicles, it's on brochures, it's on transit agency sites. 
um, the people who would call us seeking information about different options or commuter benefits and whatnot were, were not reflective of the demographic and the job types and the industries that we were reaching out to. The calls we would get would be, you know, famously from the person who um, didn't have a car, lived on the east side of town, accepted the job literally on the other side of town. Um, they started tomorrow and could I help them get to work? Um, and so, you know, having many conversations with folks who definitely could benefit from the different um, transportation options and whether it's ride matching or emergency ride home, but we would never reach outside of it. And, and also to a certain degree, we were not really equipped to be able to assist effectively. Um, the other side of that, that factor is, um, I, I spelled it out there, but the asset limited income constrained employed. So Alice, it's a um, United Way term and ultimately it's, it's the working poor. Uh, in Central Florida, and this is pre-pandemic, we'll see what the data says um, now and in the future, something like 40% of people in Central Florida um, were Alice, which are essentially, they're a paycheck away from, um, from sleeping on someone's couch, from not being able to pay their bills. And so extremely um, sensitive to price fluctuations. Uh, that makes it challenging to, to have a number of conversations about um, choosing to not drive because that also allows them to access different jobs. It's just a, a, a lot of um, kind of intimate details of people's lives when you, when you start talking to folks of all different socioeconomic backgrounds. The other side of it, here's the data point, less than 20 points of Florida. Uh, of trips in Florida or work trips. Um, that was something I actually learned during one of the commuter choice uh, segments by Dr. C. Polson. And it just made me go, whoa. So I need to impact congestion and improve the world, um, but I'm only talking to 20% of the trips. There's this other 80% that may be influencing any of my performance metrics that I'm technically not supposed to, to look at. So go ahead and click, I think twice. There we go. So kind of all, all these different factors of, okay, we have employer outreach, it seems to work, but man, we're not actually reaching the people who could maybe benefit from our services the most. Um, what could we do differently? So we looked at a way of leveraging our team's experience, our reputation, and all the relationships we had built over many, many years in Central Florida, um, and started to put together the pieces of how. How would we actually equip ourselves to talk to folks about those other types of trips? What would be the... Uh, kind of supporting resources and everything we would need to put in place. And ultimately, how can we provide services to the demographic that we were not reaching and that we probably would not reach if we kept, um, if we kept with the employer target focus that, that, we were, that we were using. So we set out to develop a pilot program using individualized social marketing techniques. Go ahead, Christy. And Thankfully, uh, out there in the world of transportation demand management or TDM, there's a lot of fantastic programs across the United States and the world who are um, experimenting and trying different things. And so we first started with market research, look at a number of programs, and I have to give full credit to uh, Julie Bond and Phil over at Cutter that, that really we, I think we probably got the green light to move ahead of this, head with this because Tampa, um, they had the neighborhood to go pilot that was uh, being in development with, I think it was Dr. Amy Lester back in the day. So it was helpful to have a Florida um, comparison point and also, okay, how are they doing it? How are they funding it? How can we learn from their approach? And as we look through all the different uh, programs and best practices, there were some clean, some uh, items that were pretty clear of what, what was common. Go ahead, Christine. So some key program elements and, and best practices overall. Barriers and benefits, pretty straightforward, right? You gotta actually understand what the actual barriers are and to be able to frame the true benefits of what you're selling. Uh, incorporating a pledge was evident in all of the, the programs that we researched. They all included timely prompts of uh, at, at time points and relevant asks specific to the individuals who are participating. And then really seeking to normalize the target behavior in that it's not um, you know, something you do on a special day, like work day. 
and also how can you structure it to provide peer support so it's just something that everybody's doing. Tools and tracking was uh, a big topic. We'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, kind of the world before all the apps, and then providing effective rewards and incentives. So seeing up that kind of toolbox of, okay, this is what it looks like the successful ingredients are, how do we build that for us? Okay. So as we set out to localize the approach, we really wanted to target our focus <laughs> on, on on the home. So instead of reaching out to work sites, nope, I don't need to talk to a human resources person to try to get uh, permission to talk to you. How do we reach you though out of your home? And can we employ those various social marketing techniques <laughs> to get people to uh, try something when it may not be convenient? And so yes, when it's convenient and inconvenient, but ultimately um, frame a conversation to to demonstrate that sometimes you, you may actually get back more than you give up. And that last bullet on there, I think is, is pretty important. It became pretty important to me that, you know, as we were working with these communities, it wasn't that, you know, we were the plucky people coming in to save the world and change their lives. We really wanted to, to show them that they already had the tools in place to, to make these changes. And that ultimately we needed to uh, make sure that once we removed ourselves from the equation that they see that they're really working together to support each other to apply it moving forward. So, go ahead. So a few of our objectives on there, that yeah, makes sense, right? Influence travel behavior um, and looking at all types of trips, not just the work trips. Let's talk to residents at their point of origin from at home and overall, let's reduce drive alone trips. Next one. We uh, took this approach of uh, four steps to the program design. And as you can see from the little walking man at the beginning, bam, we are raring to go. And then just realizing a couple of things, we kind of slowed down. And then the implementation part, it definitely felt um, like we weren't running anymore. So next slide, we'll talk through each of these steps. The first part was um, identifying where we were going to pilot this. Um, prior to us first getting this started, we had done a downtown Orlando commute challenge. It was called Go DTO. And so <laughs> promoting um, various options in the place where we're like, you know, this is the, the best bet we have of getting people in a carpool, in a van pool, transit or biking or walking, because we have all these, all these options, all these redundant options in this area. What can we do? Um, and through that experience, talking to a number of people who would live and work in downtown Orlando and yet drive their car two blocks. Um, it, was, it was a conversation I was having often enough where I was wondering how, how can we crack this nut? How can we do better? So downtown Orlando, we focused, it's approximately the 32801 zip code, actual zip code's a little, little bigger. Um, highest density, mix of land uses. I mentioned all those different uh, the mode mix. We have regional transit, so we have the local bus service, we have bus rapid transit, we have uh, our commuter rail, bike share scooters, all sorts of fun things. And by and large, um, the best bet at kind of a cultural norm of people biking and walking, go ahead. So we think, okay, downtown, people are gonna do this, right? This is gonna be easiest pilot project ever. And I said, no, let's make it harder. Let's go to a place where we may have the highest transit ridership, um, but where every other factor is going to be uh, up against it. So we went to Pine Hills, which is west side of Orange County in a broader Orlando area. Uh, it's a suburban density with high speed arterial roads. Sadly, um, it's a zip code where uh, <laughs> kind of on, on the chart of where crashes are happening in that zip code is significantly more than any other zip code in the area. Um, and Historically, an underinvested community, but very active um, community organizations where, where they're all connected, whether it's through the schools and the churches or, or the local businesses. Next slide. All right, so each of these areas, we did reach out and um, to local stakeholders and form these advisory groups. And ideally, it was to, you know, help for them to help us identify the neighborhood specific barriers, because there may be things that I think I know, but 
there's always a longer list of what I don't know. And then also look to them to provide recommendations on the equipment design. Next slide. So the input that we heard from each of our um, advisory groups, this one specific to downtown Orlando, unsurprisingly, the barriers that we heard of why people don't ride the bus or bike or walk or carpool. Um, yes, there's a perception that transit is unsafe, dirty, it smells bad. That's a direct quote. Um, and as much as I may be like, hey, I can go out and walk from point A to point B or ride my bike from point A to point B in downtown Atlanta and feel perfectly safe, by and large, most people's perception of um, the various gaps in bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, they are not inclined to feel like they can do that successfully. And then just like this general mental barrier that it's hard, I don't know how to do it. Why isn't there an app for this? Um, just this just like, um, assumption that it is impossible because they don't know how to do it now. Some of the recommendations, uh, unsurprisingly, provide education on a variety of options. Um, the cool thing was a recommendation to pr produce a simplified transit map, because a lot of what um, we heard from folks is, especially if you have a downtown area where all your bus lines converge, wow, <laughs> to figure out which bus I get on to get where, if you're new to the system, can be very overwhelming. And this idea of using coaches or travel ambassadors to show people that it's easy and maybe even a little fun. Next slide. The interesting thing we heard from the Pine Hills group, um, and it's not a surprise necessarily, but kind of how it unpacked, the barrier being that, you know, a car is a status symbol. And it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in this conversation, it came, it kind of came to, well, if you're riding the bus now, you're going to work, you're doing what you need to do, and you're saving up, What's, what are you saving up for? And everybody said, well, a car. So essentially, transit riders, uh, transit agencies, they may have these riders, but instead of like growing loyalty or keeping them on board as customers, they're just cycling out, right? You're riding the bus to, to improve your economic situation. That, that part of it is to not ride the bus anymore. So it was just an aha moment for me of like, well, how do we keep the people who are on the bus now to continue to be on the bus? Definitely, um, you know, valid lack of bicycle infrastructure depending on wherever you prefer to ride. It's, it's um, definitely tricky out there just because of the higher speed roads. And this possible technology limitations of, you know, do people have um, smartphones or more so do they have data plans with that smartphone if we were going to rely on that for trip tracking. Kind of the highlight from the recommendations was creating multilingual materials and really writing it for the layperson, like normal people, not for uh, transportation planners or even like marketing gurus, just like make it accessible as, as the tone and uh, where it's coming from and really seek to um, you know, identify existing trusted ambassadors from the community and whether that's through engaging churches or faith-based community organizations, <laughs> tapping into their existing social infrastructure. I'm so conscious of the time, so I'm talking fast. Let's keep going. So many stakeholders. Um, ultimately, we divided each of the two advisory groups, so Pine Hills and Downtown Orlando, into three core functions to help us develop branding and marketing, identify the ambassadors, and assist with participant recruitment and message testing. And then the project team was responsible for um, evaluating, so tracking the progress and then testing different types of incentives. So next slide. This was pretty cool. One of the things that we did with the uh, branding and marketing uh, subcommittees for each of them was to hear from them uh, what they felt described or reflected the values of their community. So hearing from the downtown Orlando group, which is DTO, that's, I call it DTO uh, for downtown Orlando, they described themselves as forward thinking, being like persevering, because definitely downtown Orlando has some, has had some cycles, unprecedented, that's you now propaganda word right there, but collaboration inclusive. It was just such a, a positive, like welcoming, inviting, <laughs> inviting uh, a group to, to be in a room with. And, you know, asking them like, if this was gonna be a movie, what movie would it be? I don't quite understand the Rocky II reference because I've never seen that movie, but it, it did get everybody uh, talking and thinking about different things. The DNA of the Pine Hills uh, advisory group, next slide, there we go. Um, 
the reflective fortitude, endurance, you know, how can we empower, how do we build legacy, embrace diversity, and, and reflect just courage and the bravery that they saw. Next slide. So a major barrier um, at the time, because when we first got this role and it was like 2016 and there was some stops and starts due to funding, um, apps came and went. So we were looking at what apps are existing out there so we don't have to recreate the wheel. Um, essentially, we thought the ideal would be some sort of passive tracker where you download it and then it would um, indicate if they were walking or biking and there'd be a validation point for like carpooling and things like that. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the one that was fantastic, not horrible, um, but Google bought it like in the middle of this. And we're like, we can't do that. Um, and then before we were launching, uh, District 5 did go ahead and launch Agile Mile for the overall Rethink Your Commute program. So that did um, serve a little bit of the needs on the technology side. <laughs> bus is going fast, yeah. I think you're driving it, Mike. So the recommendations uh, out of the Pine Hills Advisory Group actually pushed us in a direction that we were not anticipating. They really thought that it would be the most effective to work with um, Evans High School. This is just, you know, one of those um, convening points for the community where it's undeniable that great things are happening there. And that's where, where great things come out of. Um, it really reflected their core values that they told us about endurance, empowering, and legacy building. So we did some additional research on other student-based programs. There's one in the Minneapolis um, that we looked at specifically. Unsurprisingly, the prospect of both paying and recruiting, overseeing, um, supervising essentially children um, and asking them to knock on people's doors, essentially of adults, it just took us into this whole other realm of liability and what ifs um, that became a major barrier. So we'll keep going. Uh, recommendations for downtown Orlando. I think one of the, the great things is that the advisory group, they saw themselves as potential participants. So it wasn't that they were necessarily designing this for others, but they're like, yeah, I wanna do this too. Um, and they really defined, defined our program audience in downtown Orlando, the people who work, who live in there and work. They, the, the bookends, right? It's the young, active or inactive, but young professionals before you have kids and then the empty nesters after the kids have uh, moved out of your house. So the advisory group also helped develop our program name and branding. So we, we kind of set Rethink Your Commute on the side and said, okay, this is this new thing. How can we reflect everything the advisory group is, is telling us? And that's where, go ahead, momentum came from. And so we developed a number of custom materials and the, um, I guess the A and B, the left in the middle image is a neighborhood map. So it was centered and specific to downtown Orlando. We highlighted all the different places that you could go and walk to. So whether it's the farmer's market or the library or the many coffee shops, the image on the right was the coolest thing ever um, because we got to do a simplified transit map. And so that's actually like over a dozen different um, bus lines. But ultimately what happens is because they duplicate service going into downtown, this map shows you where you can get within 20 minutes <laughs> with a uh, transit frequency of 20 minutes or better. So we're just like, let's just make it super easy. If you're standing out there, get on the next bus that goes, it'll take you where you wanna go. Next slide. Other recommendation was really to build out the program where we're developing role models and mentors for a car light lifestyle in downtown Orlando, working with people one-on-one -on -one, uh, and, and definitely keeping communication as frequent as possible. Next slide. All right, so that it, it did launch. Um, I uh, had departed the, the, the team when it did launch, so I didn't get to uh, see it hands on, but I definitely was like texting, you know, how did it go? That picture there is of uh, the ambassadors who, who did move forward with the program. Uh, and ultimately they were expected to both live and work in downtown Orlando, participate in a number of things and meet a number of uh, kind of high bar <laughs> requirements. Uh, next slide, we'll talk about that in a bit. And uh, the rolling enrollment, so over five weeks, overall the participant uh, program length would be a 10 week timeline. And yes, folks did get uh, gift cards as weekly stipends for participating. Go ahead. 
And so in recruiting the actual participants, there was a number of steps that were taken. Ultimately, it was a lot harder than, than we anticipated. Uh, 12 people officially applied, but only five um, were accepted into the program as participants. Go ahead. And so once they were on board, there were a number of steps from taking a survey, meeting your ambassador and tracking trips. And the cool thing was that they had to send in a weekly progress report. And that was like the, go ahead, next slide. To me, it's like, ah, oh, this is why we do it. So hearing from folks, you know, this feedback that they convinced their coworkers to all use bike share, my bikes, to get to the holiday gathering, it, that was, it was less than a mile. And otherwise they would have drove. Um, incorporating the different principles of the program into their business model. I feel like they were, they were trying to suck up with that one, but that's great to hear. Um, and just hearing from folks who are walking that they just feel validated about their choice and connecting it more so to their values and that, um, that that's part of the world they want to be in. So next one. So some outcomes, you know, it was a very small group of folks who actually participated, ultimately collectively reduced 1,206 miles. You can do the math from there. It, it wasn't big enough to show big enough return, but it did show that people were trying something new. So all the participants did try a new travel mode or increase their overall use of different options um, for both discretionary and, and commute trips. And it was interesting to see that a of the options, um, people walked more, that they didn't necessarily like start to carpool. Um, it was just these short trips that before they would drive, but then they're like, oh, I can just walk. And uh, the participants did say that the weekly incentive was the strongest motivator, uh, followed by that relationship with their ambassador. And then after three months, after it ended, a uh, follow-up survey did show the participants, uh, they, they indicated that they had continued their use of transportation options once the program ended. So next slide. So, you know, lessons learned from what the data said, um, building in more time to address the myriad of different concerns and underinvested communities that have been underestimated. Um, a lot of the factors in the Pine Hills area that kept people in their cars or thinking that that was the only safe place for them. Um, public transit stigma, man, it's pervasive. Um, and we could talk more about that if we need to. Incorporating more flexibility into the recruitment of the both the ambassadors and the par participants. Um, <laughs> we were very stringent on you had to live and work in downtown Orlando. Um, and you also had to like to participate, not already pretty much be doing everything. Um, and so that's a you know, very, very small list and, and to reach those people was, was challenging. So I think that's something that I would recommend to do differently. Like even people are currently doing it, just getting them into the program provide um, like an example, like in just having broader peer support. And if they're already a bus rider, that doesn't mean that they are also a walker or biker or different things. There's ways to, to expand their pool. And then troubleshooting technology. <laughs> you know, we, we, uh, we got the Agile Mile app. It's, white label branded for rethink your commute so it wasn't momentum branded and so there i think there was a communications challenge there and just understanding you know being really smooth about explaining how easy it is to use and 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 having it also um be that same experience for people because you're not used to using some a type of trip planner and different things that can make be perfectly uh easy and straightforward for, for you and i but maybe not for others and it looks like they're the baseline data for trips that were being um, that were happening. How do you collect that data prior to any indoctrination? You know, how do we kind of remove bias and just get the real truth of what people are doing or not doing before they start? Next slide. So this is what Courtney uh, thinks the lessons are learned, and you know, the timeline greatly greatly impacted by just budget availability. And so you can't see that small print there. That's like four years of effort just to get to this point. And so we did have a number of, of stop and starts. Um, this felt like more stops than starts. The other side of it is because of just the nature of you know, our, our employment situation for the program, we really lack that ability to be nimble um, and act quickly. So, you know, okay, we want to talk to high school kids. Now the lawyers, um, that conversation comes and a number of, uh, of other factors about just how we were structured. Um, you know, I hired, we hired folks 
to work pretty much eight to five, Monday through Friday, but a lot of this outreach was on the weekend and on the nighttime. Um, and so that's where you, it, it, there's, there's lots of challenges there, kind of changing people's jobs on them isn't, isn't a recipe for success. Um, and ultimately, you know, unfortunately, the participation numbers and the results just weren't significant enough to, to build upon. Um, I don't think hope is lost because I do think there could be cool ways to learn from this and do better next time. Um, and just overall, you know, set of a four year time period, shorten that overall uh, so that you can get to the results and also iterate quickly and change it and, and make it better each time. So, all right, I think I made it through. I apologize to everybody whose time I took. Well, hopefully, like I said yesterday, we won't have any Jimmy Kimmel show moments where, where the last person doesn't get to come on like poor Matt Damon every time. Um, yeah. Um, do we have any, we have a question for, for uh, Courtney. Um, says, since 2010, what are some of the most recent commuter transit trends you have noticed, as well as what would be some of the adjustments and actions we need to make today to take full advantage of the upcoming new trends to benefit commuter transit experience and growth? In 10 seconds or less. Yeah. No, 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 whatever. <laughs> no, I know. I think. What's become clear to me is that our lifestyles, like just the American lifestyle is kind of antithetical to making using all these modes possible. And I can be, you know, as, as charming and persuasive and offer a free X, Y, Z. But if you, um, you know, in certain phases of your life, you're raising kids, I'm sorry, I, I'm not, it's not gonna be a good fit. Or if you're in a place where parking is free, <laughs> uh, you know, and there are so, few disincentives to driving alone that I feel like that's the trend that's not changing but could. Um, the other side of it is, you know, the, the trend side is um, overall our cultural move to everything must be easy and have no effort at all or I don't want anything to do with it is not to me, you know, working in the benefit of, of many things. And, and I think I said it earlier, of, Yes, if, if you ride transit or you bike or you walk, you, you do all these different options, it's going to be inconvenient sometimes. Um, and you're going to give up things. You're not going to, it's not going to be point A, point B, and you know, you're in air condition the whole time. But what you get back will be so much more. It'll be different. Um, and it's not going to be easy. <laughs> but it might be fun. You might meet new people and you might change your life. Um, but getting people to kind of get past the, well, if I can't just do this and have it ordered to my home, I don't want it. it it's yes. really, it's hurting all of us. Yeah, we, we, we are terribly uh, uh, instant gratification oriented in our society, you know. We, we want Amazon to deliver it tomorrow, you know, or, or yesterday, um, that kind of stuff. Um, I, I did have a question for you. Um, the public transit stigma you mentioned. So, that is, how do we, how do we combat that? Do, do we work with, I mean, because I did, I mean, I did the experiment this summer. I, I rode the bus for a month. Um, I, I live out in, in Northern Tallahassee and I drove to the Walmart at the end of a line and I would ride the bus every day coming in and then, um, and walk to the office, which is about a mile. Um, through downtown, it was very nice. It was, and and I got exercise, and I enjoyed it, you know. And um, I hadn't done it in a thousand and ten years, which was terrible being in the transit office. But um, um, and I was kind of expecting the worst. But but when I um, when I actually did it, it was very nice. You know, the buses aren't fancy or anything like that, but they were clean and um, they didn't smell and everyone wore their masks and it was a very positive experience. So what do, what can transit agencies do or what can CAPS do to help transit agencies combat this, this perception? Well, I think there's two kind of different situations here. I think the things that the transit agencies can control, just lean into that. And so whether it's, you know, bus stops, or if it's just making your schedule easy to understand, um, shifting the mindset to, well, my customer is only at my customer because they have to. Whatever that is that makes it easy for transit agencies to not make an effort, or will not name names, um, just taking pride in it and, and looking at it as seeing value in your product. 
Now, the other side of it, and I think Pat asked this in the chat of this, the reality of it is, um, you know, I can say for Central Florida, maybe broadly in, in Florida and other places is we have a lot of folks who um, there, there's just not a social safety net. And so there are, you know, various things from just like societal systemic <laughs> issues that all of a sudden cast a very large shadow onto our public transit systems from, you know, jails and prisons who give people a bus pass when they get, you know, out of, out of jail. And so that's fine. They have just as deserving to get on the bus. Um, but maybe we also have folks who really need mental health care, but we don't have those um, resources in the community. If they're on the bus, they're, they are impacting um, a number of things that you know, the transit agency doesn't have control over. But it's that like we're all in this together, whether we've accepted it or not. Um, and how, how do we realize that through partnerships, we take, we say yes to the role that we can play to make okay. things better. And, and are you going to implement this program again somewhere in, in, in your uh, in D5? To be determined. Um, you know, I think we're, Diana, I stopped counting the days. I think we might be 120 days or so of the, the new contract term. And what we're doing right now, um, you heard from John Hamill yesterday, is we've gone through a marketing audit. We have a, a number of initial recommendations. And the big question is, um, what makes sense? You know, and as we talk to our MPO partners and, and others of, well, if people continue to work from home, you know, how does the commuter assistance program stay relevant? I'm very intrigued, Mike, when you say that there's a new um, CAP procedure coming out because, you know, CAP is commuter, uh, but is, is there an opening for some flexibility um, to, to look at more of like, what's the goal? <laughs> What are we trying to achieve and what audiences make, make the most sense so they're just saying yeah. you shall. Yeah. Well the, the we'll always um, give first bow to to the work commuter because um, the the department uh, as an agency wants to better utilize the um, the transmission system at peak hour because that's that's the congestion time. And so even though, if it, like you said, it's only 20% of work trips statewide and in m many areas, it's more than that. Um, and, and those trips are occurring at peak to peak hour. And so if we can just get a few of them to, to, to um, switch modes um, or consider switching modes and, and, and try it, that, that makes an impact because we aren't gonna be able to expand the, um, the um, the um we won't be able to expand the the transportation system to to deal with that but you make a very good case that that um there are a lot more trips that impact our system and and um and it's not just about transportation tra system efficiency it's about giving the residents of florida um multimodal options for their whole life experience and so of course I think the interesting here thing here, Mike, is um, you know there's no more peak hour; it just is peak. Um, and it's interesting. You know, we'll see what happens once everybody mm -hmm. goes back. But um, yeah, yeah. And we'll see. We'll see. Um, Christine and, uh, said. Christine said that someone had a hand raised. Did they want to ask a question? Um, yes, Marie Bowen would like to ask a question. So uh, Christine will unmute her phone, her and let her speak. Marie, are you there? Marie? It just takes a second to find the right buttons on this. You need to unmute your, uh, your, your thing down in the left-hand corner of your screen, Marie, if you want to ask a question. There, okay. Hi. We can hear you. Um. Um, I was asked to unmute, but I didn't need to. I was just listening to the conversation. It's Marie Bowen. Oh, we thought you had, we thought you had a question. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. I, now I see why. <laughs> okay. Welcome um, to the summit. Yes, welcome. Um, well, I guess then we can move on to our next session. Thank you so much. And I love this picture of you on a bike in high heels. 
Well, if you ever want to go viral on LinkedIn, that picture did it. So well, I can I can possibly see why. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Courtney. And um, um, Julie, are we moving forward with our next presenter? We're going to go ahead and move on to the state, the town, and the private sector common vision presentation. Okay. Well then, our next session, our next presentation, as Julie said, is the state, the town, and the private sector common vision, different perspectives. And as, as a program of the FDOT South Florida Community Services um, program has taken a special interest in developing a custom transportation demand management program for the town of Miami Lakes to help its employees, employers find alternative modes of transportation to get to work. The main focus of this TDM program is to educate and present the town of Miami Lakes employees employers on possible ride sharing options um, including carpooling and bampooling, as well as any transit or biking options that are feasible for those who can do it. Uh, the presentation will explore the partnership between um, South Florida Community Services and the town of Miami Lakes from the town employees perspective, and as well as the South Florida Community Services perspective. Our presenters will be Michael Zayas Morales, Transportation Planning Manager for the town of Miami Lakes. Um, Mike Zayas has a professional has professional experience in private and public sectors through the island of Puerto Rico and the state of Florida, working in fields like planning, transportation, project management, and banking. Mike holds an MS in GIS from the University of Arizona, a master's in city community and regional planning from Boston University, and an MBA from the Inter-American University of Puerto Rico. I imagine Mike must not have any more room on his wall for a, um, for a, uh, um, another degree. And so, and then standing in for Jerry Mullings, the senior planner for South Florida, it will be Christina Morris and um, Christina Morrow, Morrow, excuse me. And- um, A mic. Yes. Um, Paula just arrived, so can we- Oh, so we're gonna switch back to that. Yes, so we're gonna backtrack because he is, He's, you know, right on, almost on time. So we'll just backtrack and have him do his presentation. Okay. Now. Well, changing gears. Okay, our, our next presentation will be complexity is your friend, how transportation systems will adapt to climate reality. And we, we have the tools today to uh, fully, to fundamentally shift our transportation networks from sources of inequality that fuel the climate crisis to pathways of opportunity to a more sustainable future. Um, will we put those tools to use? And our presenter today is Pablo Nunez Ueño. Um, he's with uh, Nunez, Nunez Ueño Consulting. Um, and he's a sustainable, sustainable mobility innovator. He has the honor of serving the transportation and the land use policy lead for the Front and Center, a coalition of organizations of people of color working towards climate justice. And um, Paolo joins us today from the Boston area, and please take it away. Thanks, Mike. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, excellent. So I am going to share my screen. Um, let me see if I... So it says host disabled uh, participant screen sharing. So somebody will have to make that change in the back. Um, while, while that it's done. I just want to say thank you so much. It's such a, an honor to be able to speak to you all about this. I'm, um, let's see, I'm uh, Paulo Nunes Bueno, yeah, um, and I, I uh, run an organization called Nunes Bueno Consulting, and I work with clients all across the country uh, at the intersection of uh, transportation planning, equity, and sustainability. Um, and I want to share with you some thoughts, and then uh, I, I guess we, we have some time for questions and, and discussion if, if people are interested. So, um, Mike, can you confirm? Ooh, there, there you are. <laughs> That's starting at the end. Uh, can <laughs> you, <laughs> so, <Let's see. laughs> all right. So, uh, Mike, you can see my screen, right? Yes. 
All right, so a uh, little bit about me. So I uh, started off my career at uh, King County Metro in Seattle, Washington in a program called the Commute Trip Production Services um, Program. And so Washington State back in the 90s had a, uh, a really smart set of, of uh, programs that were started one of which is called the state commit commute trip production law that requires uh, organizations of 100 employees or more to track and reduce the number of their their uh, mode share and reduce the percentage of drive alone commutes that they're generating so i got to work on that and then i i was lucky enough to go work at Seattle Children's Hospital right as the hospital was expanding massively and transportation was going to be the thing that actually caused uh, potentially the, the, the hospital not to be able to be built. And so I was able to design a sort of TDM first, transportation demand management first approach to the, the, the hospital transportation planning that A, was able to make sure that we were able to double the size of the hospital and get approved. But we set a, a 20 year goal to reduce our emissions and our drive alone trips by 40%. And in fact, using some of the methods that I'm gonna share with you today, we were able to reduce that by 40% to meet that target in 10 years. Um, then I, was, I worked as the director of the transit and mobility division at the city of Seattle, uh, coordinating the, uh, the, the programs for transit, for bike share, for parking, uh, and for commute trip production in the city of Seattle. And then I started my company and, and had the, just the incredible honor to work with a variety of amazing clients all across the country. So I'm gonna to start today uh, by sharing this picture, which uh, probably a lot of folks on the call have, have seen already. This is just about over a hundred people in their cars. Um, this is the same hundred people weirdly sitting in chairs in the middle of the street. Um, this is the same number of people, the same people on their bikes. And this is uh, the same number of people on a light rail vehicle. And, oh, this is the light rail vehicle and the, the previous one was on the bus. So, you know, geometrically in terms of space, these, these other modes are really, really efficient. And when you do the study of throughput per hour, that's really borne out, right? That a, a car lane carries between 600 and 1600 people an hour and a bike lane carries, you know, four times that much. And then a sidewalk amazingly is able to carry so many people and a, a transit way between 10,000 and 25,000. Now, I show you this knowing that I, I, many people have seen this, but the reason why I bring this up is really because of this picture. So this, yeah, you can tell from the background here, this is the Space Needle. Uh, so this is Seattle, circa 2008, 2009. So this is a picture that was taken really early in the morning and uh, you know, sort of some notables here. This is Ron Sims, who was, you know, just an amazing leader. It was the King County executive at the time. And this was uh, Greg Nichols, mayor of Seattle. Uh, this my, <laughs> I think this is Rachel Smith, although I never asked her. Who is now uh, president of of the the Seattle Metropolitan Chamber. So the. The, but that's not why I wanted to show you this picture. I want to show you this picture because this is Second Avenue in Seattle, and and it is as simple as you can get of a street, right? This is a street that that a uh, 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 enterprising ninth grader, a really hardworking ninth grader, could or me, I could design this street. This is 
you know, a, a sort of barely defined bus lane, three general purpose car lanes in one direction and a crappy uh, bike lane with some parking on the side, right? In, in 2008, 2009, ninth graders or me, you know, somebody who's not an engineer could design this road. The reason why I wanted to show you this picture is because is somebody chatting me? Because I won't be able to. Uh, okay, don't don't type in quite. I won't be able to look at the at the chat at the same time. But Julie, my friend, is going to help me out. So um, this is Second Avenue today, and it's a vastly more complicated, more complex, more sophisticated piece of infrastructure. It's got a, a protected two-way bike lane. It's got a really complicated signal network. We're thinking now about uh, the concept of curb space management, which I don't think even existed in 2009. So when, when we're thinking about the, the functions that Second Avenue has to perform today in terms of having uh, a two-way bike lane, in terms of having a musician's loading zone for this particular music venue here, here's another musician's loading zone. We have to have uh, planters and we're thinking about this, the streetscape and, and how trees contribute to that. We went from a very simple four phase intersection to a much more complicated signal design that has a, a dedicated signal for bikes. It's holding turning traffic. It's got all kinds of temporary restrictions on parking and allowing parking in, in other areas that, that my division, my, my former division at SDOT manages. So the, the point is, is that in those 13 or 14 years since that picture was taken, since that picture that was, you know, this dead simple of, of stripes down the middle of the road to sort of generally, you know, manage how cars are flowing doesn't work anymore. And we shouldn't settle for it, right? That when we, when we manage parking in this way, for example, or when we're only looking at our infrastructure and our management in, a, in, in the, the, the sort of old Second Avenue way, what we get is is an over-reliance on automobiles that is a burden to commuters. It's a burden to travelers. It's a, it's, it, it has the, the, the incredible impact that we're seeing in terms of the climate crisis and it's hard for cities to manage. So what, what I'd like to, well, what I'm working on and what I, what I really, um, and I'm looking forward to, to starting a, a conversation with you all about is what are the tools that we already have in our toolkit to make sure that we're designing a transportation system that puts people, not modes at the center of our, of our planning, at the center of our thinking. That when we, what, what my experience and the, the experience that, I, that I've had in my career that I'm trying to synthesize now is that there are these elements of culture, of cost, of convenience, of concrete that we forget to manage. And what you get is, is auto dependence and all of these side and, and, and uh, unfortunate impacts of that. So I'm gonna give you two different examples of what that might look like of putting people at the center of our decision making, particularly when we're thinking about uh, how we're adapting to the climate crisis and how we're adapting to that in a way that that brings in people that have been left out of our planning, have been left out of our consideration when we're doing maintenance, have been shut out of our car-centric investments that we've been made so that we've made so far. So. Why, why should we do this now? What, what, what hope do we have that we are actually gonna do this? Well, so uh, potentially our old friend, Winston Churchill has a thought where he, when he said that, you know, Americans will always do the right thing. 
once they've exhausted all the other options. So who knows if Winston Churchill actually said this or not, it doesn't even matter. But the point is, is that we're really at an either or moment, right? This is a screenshot of uh, something that happened in June of this year. So uh, my family just moved from Seattle to Philadelphia uh, and we started our drive across country on June 29th, I think. And this was what was happening in June 28th. There were areas of Portland that were 118 degrees. Our, our infrastructure in Seattle is just not built for this. As, as you probably know, we have vascular bridges. There have bridges that, that, that open like this. And when it's too many consecutive days of 90 degrees, the leaves of the bridge expand and they won't open anymore, right? This is, this is a, un, and, and we're gonna get tired of saying this, there are unprecedented historic events are happening every other day now, right? So we really, so we really have a, a, as I see it, the situation is, is we have an either or sandwich with a both and in the middle when we're talking about transportation. So either we do something to really drastically decarbonize the way we do transportation or we're screwed. And the way that we're gonna decarbonize transportation is Yes, to electrify as much as we possibly can, as fast as we can, and make sure that we have lots of other options for people to not drive. Because the current system that we've built essentially makes owning, operating, insuring a car the price of admission for participating in society. And that is just fundamentally unfair. It doesn't work. Right? It costs upwards of $10,000 a year to own, operate, and insure a car. And not everybody can do it financially. Not everybody can do it physically. Not everybody can do it because they're too young. Right? So we have, we have in, in, in Washington State, and I'm sure that, that the, the numbers in, in uh, the rest of the country are, are this stark or maybe even more, 25% uh, of people in Washington don't have driver's licenses. And yet we spend 3% of the state budget on things that aren't car related. So either we're gonna make this change or we're gonna be made to make this change, right? I much prefer making a choice rather than be made to do something. So I wanna take a moment with this picture that unfortunately, is so common that, that people with disabilities were left out of the equation when we built this, were left out of the equation when we maintained it, were left out of the equation when we planned it. Now, the thing that, that I think is really important about this is that there is no difference in the, the set of tools, there is no difference in the set of engineering, there is no difference in the planning for the, the work that it took to build this or the work that it took, that it would have taken to build sidewalks here that people who happen not to be driving can use. It's exactly the same set of skills, it's exactly the same set of tools, it's exactly the same set of materials. It just is the fact that we haven't built this here because these people aren't important. They didn't figure in the, the system that we built. That has to change, right? So this is, this is a, a screenshot of uh, my city uh, or a, a street near me here in Philadelphia. And you see this a lot, that people walk, people choose to walk on the street for a variety of different reasons, but primarily because we maintain the streets and we don't maintain the sidewalks, right? For some reason, we've made a decision that making sure that streets are in reasonable shape, not even great shape, but that streets are in reasonable shape is a problem for everybody and making sure that sidewalk, sidewalks work is a problem for the adjacent property owner. It's crazy, it doesn't make any sense, right? So now the, the, the topic of the rant today <laughs> was that we have the tools that we need 
to make sure that we bring equity and we start to address our climate crisis in the way that we do transportation. And I'm not sure about Florida, but in, in Washington state, 45% of our, our climate emissions come from transportation. So, you know, it's not like this is an insignificant number here. This is the, this is, this is the ball game in a lot of ways. And if we do it and preserve the same old inequities, we really haven't solved the entire problem. So absolutely not a designer here. Obviously, this took about, took about two seconds. This, this is the same person that could design the original Second Avenue. But my thinking is, is we have an enormous amount of unused roadway capacity that people feel comfortable walking on residential streets on, on the residential streets on the sidewalk. So let's formalize that. Let's figure out a way to solve two or three or four problems at once, right? So, you know, this is the, the old adage, if you have a really gnarly problem, make it bigger, right? One of the problems with electrification is that, you know, middle income, lower income people don't have garages, don't have driveways, don't, won't have a place to charge their electric cars. And the more that we mandate that, the bigger that problem is going to be. So what if we move the car parking into the street, reduce the number of feet that we're devoting to general purpose car lanes, figure out a public charging system, and at the same time, devote some of that space for people to walk. So when you think about these, these factors that, that make up this, this transition that, that I've that, that I've been working on, this idea of, of culture. Each one of these belongs in, in a nesting pattern with each other, and they all need to work together. So culture is this idea that, you know, we, unfortunately, as, as a species, we, we value status so much. And we've created a system where the people without status don't get any resources, don't get as many resources. So the, the folks that are operating their wheelchairs in, in a place that's entirely hostile to that, right? That's, that's as much a, a product of a culture that says that those people aren't important as any kind of engineering decision, right? So we need to think about the culture. We need to address cost. And I'll talk about cost next. We need to think about convenience and convenience I think is a marker of user experience. The, the story that, that I think uh, everybody can relate to is that, well, we, we you know, act like maniacs to park as close as possible to the door of the mall so that we can do what? Walk all day inside of the mall. And why is that? That's because the outside of the mall was designed in no way to accommodate or to make a delightful experience for the person walking. But the stuff inside the mall was designed entirely to, to, to accommodate, to celebrate, to delight the person who is walking. And so all of these things, when we put them together, will create more freedom for more people, regardless of whether they can own, operate, insure a car, to be able to, to live their lives, to live their best lives, even if they don't feel like, or they can't afford to drive a Tesla. So this is just another example. I don't know why this stuff is up here. I guess maybe you can see it, maybe I can't. But the, the idea of, of how, we, how we take this to parking and, and these, the, the idea that, that in, in some fashion or another, we've, we, we have injected in the DNA of so many of the facets of our, of our transportation system, a, an auto-centric point of view that makes it more difficult for actual everyday users, including drivers, is something that we, we need to unpack. And I'm gonna give an example of that as it relates to parking at destinations, not, not municipal parking. So many times what, what we encounter is, let me see, what we encounter is a program that 
forces somebody, says, hey, Julie Bond, welcome to this organization. What type of commuter are you? Are you a parker or are you a transit user? Or are you a carpooler? Or are you a bicyclist? I know that Julie's a bicyclist. But in fact, Julie is none of those things, right? She's just a person who makes choices. And sometimes it makes sense for her to make a choice to, to drive and park. And sometimes she wants to get on her bike and bike to work. But what the vast majority of universities and, and work sites that, that, that have transportation programs, they force people to identify with the mode. And they say, Julie must choose because it's easier for us if she chooses. It's easier for me to say, oh, Julie's a parker. I'm gonna charge her for parking. I'm gonna give her a, a, a parking pass. Or Julie's a bus driver. She takes the bus. I'm gonna give her the bus pass and then be done with her. Say, Julie, don't bother me anymore. Well, that's fine. There's not a lot of technology needed for that. It's certainly a lot cheaper. But the cons are so great because Julie's locked in. There's no flexibility there. It doesn't account for the day-to-day -day realities of being a person who is running late and needs to drive or who would like to take the bus sometimes or who has a person who happens to be able to share a car ride with them every once in a while without committing to do it so often. So all of these things, and, it, and, and honestly, it's the vast majority of commute programs in the country, make it really difficult for mode shift because we're asking people to commit to one. So following the concrete, the culture cost concrete convenience model, we need to design something that's dynamic, that's really centering Julie, centering the choice maker and making it something that, 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 that she can choose on a daily basis because that's how decisions are made. They're not made about an identity. They're not identities. They're not something that you are or you aren't. It's something that you do. So how could we design systems where people can choose to reserve a parking spot or choose to go and drive if they want to? And then the next day, take transit. And the next day, share a ride. And the next day, bike, right? Because those marginal changes in the aggregate will make a big deal, right? So, uh, and, and that was the basis of the system that I designed at Seattle Children's where we said, hey, you wanna drive to work? Great, we have a spot for you. It's gonna cost you whatever, you know? I mean, I can, I can if folks have questions and they're interested, you know, we, we really took equity into account when we designed this because we, we understood by looking at the data that our lowest, our lowest paid staff had a, a huge overlap, almost entire overlap with the staff that had to come in very early. And so we made the, the parking where costs for people that are coming in before 7 a.m. where there's fewer transit choices available, pretty affordable. And then it went up from there. And at the same time, when people carpooled or bike or took, the, took transit or walked to work, we gave them a reward. We say, this is $5 in Julie's paycheck when she took these other modes for that day, right? So we're balancing the, the cost part of this equation. And at the same time, make it very, very easy to people to see the aggregate impact to them and to others of these choices. You know, you go through these choices, you pay for whatever parking you use, you get an incentive or something is, you know, you get an incentive when you do something else or you get a subsidy and all of that is, is combined and personalized as the commute statement back to you. So this is just sort of one example of this approach, but we should be able to apply this to all of the facets of the transportation system that we're using so that, that we're designing, that we're implementing, that we're operating so that ultimately what we get is more freedom for people that are making a choice to drive or not drive every day, more safety, and at the same time, more dignity for everyone and fewer emissions. So that's the end of my spiel. 
uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm I'm uh, I'm not quite sure what else is on the program, but I'm I'm happy to uh, take some questions or just be here for a discussion if folks want to have a discussion. Fight! I'll adjudicate <laughs> some fights. <laughs> uh, um, we have a question from um, Karen Cress in Tampa, and she says, "What price strategies have?" you seen effectively manage VMT and how do you get politicians to take that leap? Um, well, yeah, so that's that's a, a really important point uh, that that the, the 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 political framework needs to start from this point of agreement that we we need to manage the system in a way that's more equitable and also that is more sustainable. So that's that's step one. And I think that the the, the pricing strategies are there there are many, but the really important sort of rules of thumb that you want to keep in mind is that you want to make sure that you that your pricing strategies are maximizing flexibility, that you're not asking people to to pay uh, ahead, but you're asking people to pay as they use. And Number two, that uh, you you balance the cost of the alternatives with the cost of driving, so that you, as much as possible you're making the the alternatives cheaper. Um, I had a question about the the, the whole dynamic system. W what happens on that occasional day when too many people decide they need to drive their car um, and overload your parking? Um, well. Right. So that so that's that's uh, Mike, that's that's a really important point. And so that goes to my point about sophistication. Right. So that when, you know, clients of mine, for example, at uh, uh, Oregon State University in Portland, they they are, you know, they have a big staff. They they run a very dynamic parking operation. They are selling, uh, you know, they, they have a certain subset of the population that they offer uh, a very expensive permit, still a daily permit, but that means Mike can drive any day that he wants. But there's a, a big chunk of people that, that need to reserve in order for them to be able to okay. drive on campus, right? So that's not the only way to solve this problem that, that you're talking about, but what it what it shows is is that the easy way to solve the problem that may happen once or twice a year is to overbuild parking. And then what happens when you overbuild the parking? The easy way to do that, right? And by easy, I mean stupid. Mm -hmm. because it's incredibly expensive and it's going to generate that dynamic that I'm sure all the folks on the call are, are familiar with of induced demand, right? On both sides of the equation in terms of saying, oh, shoot, now I have to monetize all this extra parking that I built for the potential Christmas peak. Mm -hmm. And so now I need to devalue the, the, the cost of that. And that for, therefore, that generates more people driving. So the it's, it's an absolutely critical question, but the, the answer cannot be we overbuild for the one day peak. The answer needs to be we get really sophisticated with how we manage demand every day. Okay, that sounds good. And because um, I mean, that played into your earlier point about, you know, employers or, or, or you know, biz, building managers, or whatever, forcing you into uh, a, a single mode as far as you know uh, your travel option you know you're the bike rider you're the transit you know and so you have no choices um to mix it up which which really is more realistic in in, in people's lives you know it so. is and and you know and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about carpooling because carpooling is an example of such unadulterated failure on our parts in in the the tdm world right because we say hey uh mike and phil do you guys promise to carpool x number of days you know and cross your heart and hope to die if you don't and then now i'm going to give you access into the parking garage right mm -hmm. but then what we know from the data is that people hardly ever commute together as much as they say that they will 
And often you're driving alone together, not together. You're driving alone at the same time, mm -hmm. right? So we're really not encouraging people to change behavior. We're just encouraging people to lie. <laughs> But how do you get around that? I mean, right. how, ah, with, so without, how, having, how you, without having the, poli you know, vigilantes uh, enforcing it for that's, you. That's right. So this is this is what we did at Children's and and it, it worked incredibly well. And it, it provided this really sort of interesting sort of data revelation. What we said is we had parking gates and we programmed the gates to only open for people that were assigned in that garage or for anyone who could present two valid badges at the same time. So Mike and Phil show up together. And then what I did is I split that parking charge. So it's, it's $5 for each person instead of $10 for one person. And at the same time, you got the $3.50 bonus for that day, okay. right? So, so that is, a, is an example of a self-reinforcing, self-managing managing system. And what we learned is that on average, Phil had six different carpool partners in one year, as opposed to making him this pretend marriage with Mike that you guys are going to be this yeah. inseparable bond of carpool. Yeah, right? he, has he has commitment issues. So, right, yeah. exactly. Right. So, yes. So uh, yeah, carpooling is a much more polygamous activity <laughs> than, uh, than than we give it uh, <laughs> than than we assume that it is. But that's just another example of well, you know, we we make these systems that are for the benefit and for the the convenience of the operator, and they really don't perform like we think that they're going to do. Right? That that and carpooling is is a um, is a prime example of that. And uh, I liked earlier you're your, your, um, showing the, the photos of the different modes and the impact on the physical system. I mean, that's a famous thing from, I think the, the initial one was from the Netherlands or something, I think, then they did that. Um, but um, in Seattle, are they implementing that kind of physical um, strategy all through downtown? Because it doesn't help to have what, just one corridor. Uh, especially for bikes, if you don't have, you know, a whole network of protected bike lanes. It's true. So, so that bike lane that you see on Second Avenue is now complemented by uh, another two-way bike lane on Fourth Avenue, and there is. <laughs> That's funny. Carpooling is polyg. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, it, it's. Um, it, it, it's coming and it's it's really happening. And at the same time, we see these, you know, shocking mistakes like we've done in, in the Seattle waterfront where, you know, we, we spent $5 billion to, to, to build a, a deep board tunnel that, that uh, uh, replaces the capacity that was taken down from a really bad elevated highway. But instead of being happy with replacing the capacity, now we're building a, a surface highway with five lanes of each on each direction on the waterfront, you know. And it's and and part of that is just this incredible policy failure, policy of imagination, where the adjacent property owners weren't given enough of of uh, of a choice to say. It, it, you know, do you, do you want a five lane highway in front of your establishment or do you want something that's going to make it easier for people that are walking and shopping and enjoying the waterfront? So, you know, I, I wish I could say that in Seattle, uh, we were making all good decisions, but it's, uh, it's always a fight, you know, the, the, oh, yeah. the, the, the inherent the, the, the inertia of doing it the same old way is so strong. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question here from uh, Sharon L Lewinson. Are you finding first and last mile micro-ability options are helping to increase transit ridership? Well, so let's see. I, I think that we need to be very Gimlet-eyed. This is my picture of Gimlet-eyed. Um, uh, when we come to, we need to be very skeptical of the claims of of micro mobility. Uh, uh, not not necessarily bike share and and scooter share, but but definitely 
of um, of the the, the TNCs of um, of Uber and Lyft, um, because all of the data seemed to indicate that they they hurt transit ridership, and for every mile uh, of of riding that people do in TNCs, there's a mile and a half of the driver, uh, you know, driving around to to pick up a fare. Now, in in terms of of whether, if you mean micro mobility in terms of, of bike share, scooter share, and you know the, all the other newfangled things that we see in all of our cities, you know all these weird looking vehicles, I I don't know if they're adding or or not to transit ridership. That's that's a, an interesting question. It's also a question that's going to be really hard for us to get at because the the sort of zenith of the micro mobility programs happened right as covid was happening and so you know the the data right the the data on on transit ridership is not going to be back at normal levels for another couple of years so we won't know and then we have a question another question from karen um, in tampa do preferred parking spaces for carpools work to recruit new carpoolers no. I think I, oh, that, I think that, that, that's a major that's a major fundamental building block of what 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 what's your answer? I my I think my answer to that is that you're you're giving somebody a a benefit based on what they say they're going to do, not based on an actual behavior that they do. So I I much prefer the 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 idea that you get your best parking stalls and you put them behind a gate and you charge for them daily and then you charge a lower price that you split to people that actually show up here's the difference between there's a huge difference between saying that you're a carpooler and actually carpooling and i'm not saying that carpoolers are are you know on on average bigger liars than most people it's just that uh, we are the way that we found to encourage carpoolers encourages people to be very, 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 very aspirational about what they're actually going to do. But you are saying they're so sociopathical liars. <laughs> 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 well, we, have, no. we have one more question here. Um, your both and strategy for electrification and alternative modes is interesting. Wouldn't electrification encourage sprawl to some extent, reducing the viability of, of alternative modes? Can you elaborate on how your approach navigates the tension of the sprawl question? Well, I, I, I don't think that we have a choice not, not to electrify. We must, and we, we need to do it as, as soon as possible. And at the same time, we need to really get our arms around our, our land use policies so that they, they encourage these, you know, the, 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 these beautiful concepts that people have come up with recently, like I'm sure everybody on the call has heard of it, of the 15 minute city of, of thinking about how, what are the needs that, that people have and making sure that we're, we're designing places and then changing the concrete that we have today. You know, in my example of saying, well, we, we know how to maintain roads. So let's make sure that, that roads are viable places where people with disabilities and people that are walking can be and can move. Uh, but, but creating uh, 15 minute cities in, in managing our land use and in, in managing the way that, that we're citing things so that people can walk and bike to their necessities is, is critical. So I, I don't think that electrification is necessarily inducive of, of sprawl. I think that the status quo is inducive of sprawl and we need to change that drastically because we're, you know, we're subsidizing longer and longer commutes by by providing free highway capacity. Yeah, hopefully the day will come rather than having three gas cars in your garage, you'll just have one electric car in your garage and then you'll you'll have all these other options for a myriad of, of trips that you'll be doing that day. Okay, exactly. and I, I, I lied, but there is another question. Um, do you have any thoughts on prioritization prioritizing regional bus and rail service over airport expansion plans. These oh. are the kinds of longer distance transportation modes that we can more easily electrify 
but by comparison, they don't receive as much attention or funding as airports. Oh, yeah, that's such an interesting question. So I, I think that, you know, so part of the work that, that I'm doing with uh, Front and Centered in Washington State, they're one of my clients now, is we're really trying to create uh, a very clear link through data uh, between our transportation investments and yes, greenhouse emissions, but local uh, pollutants, the, the, what, what the EPA calls the criteria pollutants and impact on health in the local, uh, in, in the local area in the, in the very local area. So this, this organization front and center has created an environmental health disparities map that will show you uh, hey, you know, diesel emissions or small particulate emissions in this area are so much higher than in that area over there. Why is that? Well, it's because we were able to site the, the airport here and not over there. So uh, I think that the, the point is really, really important. And we need to start creating these tools, particularly the data tools, the visualization to be able to say, hey, the, these, the, 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 you know, the, the regional transportation, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, even the, the high speed rail is going to have a, a, a much lesser impact on health and on specific people's health. You know, the environmental health disparities also map that, that we created also allows you to filter by population and say, hey, here's a population of, you know, people of color, of indigenous people who have, you know, historically borne the brunt of the development that we've done. And if we choose to do this project, they will, they will have even more impacts and be able to, we, that should help us make different decisions. Now, you know, can we inject the, 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 the critical part of the question is, is there's much more attention and money paid to airports and highway expansion than these other things. And that's, that's the, the critical thing that we need to change. Well, finally, we have a sympathetic, you know, person in, in the leadership, you know, Amtrak Joe and electric car Joe, who, who maybe will finally help tip the balance start tipping the balance um, on, on these issues. It's true, it's true. But we also need to be really nerdy with how we implement this and think about, well, how, you know, because just giving the, 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 the bipartisan infrastructure deal or, or the 3.5 trillion, it actually scares the daylights out of me because if we just pour more money mm -hmm. into the, the federal highway programs, we are going to be essentially, you know, more highways are just like pipelines. They're mm -hmm. part of the consumption of fossil fuels. We, we can, even our most aggressive pathways to electrification, they're not enough for us to meet our 1.5 degree reduction that, that or our 1.5 degree target, right? We need, to sh we need to mode shift. And if we don't change the way these programs are funded at USDOT, then pouring more money is just going to make the, the problem worse. True, true. So at least at least people are talking about this. No, issue. no, absolutely. Yeah, no, I know so. I don't mean to be a, a downer about all this stuff. <laughs> I just, I just, <laughs> well, you do call people so, sociopathic liars and <laughs> but um Julie, do we have any more questions or I know that looks like it. So uh Looks like we're done with this session. And thank you so much. That was a well, great Well, thank session. you so much, Paula. That was very interesting. Thank you so much for having me. And Julie knows how to get a hold of me if folks have questions. And I, I'd love to hear them. Uh, keep in touch. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. OK. And now we're back to the state, the town, and the private sector. You know, the mystery we're trying to you know, unveil here. Um, I won't go back to the whole introduction because you all can remember that. But I wanted to uh, let you know that a couple of little known facts about Michael and Christina. Um, they, um, for one thing though, we didn't get, I didn't get a bio of Christina. So when she comes on, she'll have to give us a little background of herself. But I did come across something that, that will be very interesting. For Michael, um, he is a rapper 
and he uh, operates under performs under the name of Zaya Papi and is currently performing on Thursdays in clubs all over the Miami-Dade area. So um, be sure to catch him if you can. I'm sure you can look him up on, on the local listings. And for Christina, she is currently the TikTok champion um, for 2,346 postings of synchronized dancing videos. Um, they're quite, she is very talented and um, look under the, 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 the um, her name is the KM Dancing Queen on TikTok and you'll find them. And with that, I turn it over to Michael and Christina. Turn on your mics. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate the uh, good, good word for my TikTok. So, um, you need to turn up your volume a little bit because we can't hear you. All right, I'll just try to there. talk a little bit Perfect. Better. Perfect. All right, great. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I appreciate that uh, good word for my TikTok. Um, <laughs> so I am very happy to be here today to um, give this presentation with Michael Zayas Morales. Um, Again, was a transportation planner for the town of Miami Lakes. Um, I also just wanna start out um, apologizing if um, I'm disappointing anyone. Uh, I am standing in for our uh, program director, uh, Jeremy Mullings today. Um, so you'll just have to deal with me. <laughs> uh, but I have worked um, uh, with Jeremy with the South Florida Commuter Services Program um, since 2018. Um, and the South Florida Commuter Services is the regional CAP um, program that spans um, uh, District 4 and District 6 uh, for FDOT. Uh, so that's Indian River from the Treasure Coast all the way down to Key West. Uh, and just a little bit about me since uh, I guess you didn't get my bio in time. Um, I have a master's degree in urban and regional planning from Florida Atlantic University. Um, and I've served as the interim executive director for the downtown Fort Lauderdale Transportation Management Association um, recently. Um, so just a little bit about me. So again, uh, we'll be presenting um, about uh, some different perspectives on TDM uh, between different stakeholders and we'll provide uh, the example of our recent partnership um, again with the town of Miami Lakes and SFCS. Um, you can go to the next slide. So we'll start out with a little bit of a brief description I did kind of give already about SFCS um, in our vision uh, for TDM. Uh, we'll also touch on briefly um, transportation demand management strategies, and then I will hand it over to Michael, uh, and he'll uh, give you a little bit of insight into the town of Miami Lakes and what they're doing to improve mobility in the town. Um, and then I will jump back in and describe um, what we did with our recent partnership for the employer TDM program. Uh, we'll follow it up with some questions and I'm not sure if we are running behind on time, but I will be cognizant of that. <laughs> and next slide. So um, I know by now, um, everyone obviously on this call, we all have a basic understanding of the computer system program um, to promote alternatives to driving alone. Uh, and Overall, the goal is to reduce vehicle miles traveled, um, generally you know, a straightforward goal <laughs> that we all have, uh, which might seem impossible um, understanding with population growing annually, but um, we can definitely make a difference through partnerships and applying appropriate TDM strategies um, that we'll describe more detail on the next slide. Um, so we wanted to, I just wanted to showcase some of the most um, used TDM strategies we have um, up here on the right, but this is definitely not a comprehensive list um, in any sense. Um, so as um, mentioned in the actual introduction of this um, session, uh, some TDM strategies might be more effective depending on the context of your region or even local area. Um, so with carpooling and ride matching, um, that might be a little more appropriate in a dense urban area. Um, where there's more possibility of people um, being able to carpool um, versus in a, you know, a rural area, we might prioritize, um, for example, in uh, Western Palm Beach County, um, promoting the guaranteed ride home options. Um, if there's a lot of transportation dependent people who really rely on having reliable transit, um, that might be an, another way that we go about um, strategizing and using TDM. 
Then pooling obviously is another option that's typically through employers. Um, and we're all obviously familiar with working from home now, um, which is a, definitely um, a way to reduce VMT uh, just by st stopping it altogether. Um, but uh, as an employer, you might be, um, you know, that might be difficult to completely uh, transition into working from home. So a flex schedule program might work better. Um, in addition, I wanted to mention that employers might look at, um, you know, working from home not as a way to reduce BMT, but as a way of keeping their employees safe, um, obviously with the pandemic, um, or promoting it as a benefit, uh, supporting you know, work-life balance. So it's a couple of different perspectives there. Um, and in, in, in South Florida, uh, we really focus on, uh, well, as a part of the CAP program, reducing BMT, especially on regional corridors. So our average commuter in South Florida commutes 26 miles um, each direction every day. Uh, mass transit is obviously uh, a great TDM strategy and we can't discount the importance of those first and last mile connections with the transit terminals. So that would be the ped and bike connectivity as well as parking ride facilities. Um, and some other examples of TDM uh, not listed uh, but previously mentioned would be the congestion pricing for toll facilities, uh, also dynamic parking prices, um, and again, those priority parking spaces for carpoolers and van pullers as an incentive. N uh, next slide. So getting into the partnership with the town of Miami Lakes, um, one of the main reasons uh, we, we wanted to partner with them is that they're already a ready and willing partner. Uh, as you know, they were already wanting to implement TDM um, without the, the South Florida Commuter Services. So it's definitely an opportunity for the town to leverage uh, the resources of, of the CAP program. Uh, so the first thing we did when um, we made the, the initial uh, discussions and the partnership was we wanted to get a better understanding of the existing conditions in the town. Um, so, you know, we looked at things like residency and employment where people live and where people are working within the town. Uh, we also wanted to know um, uh, and pay close attention to understanding where existing traffic congestion is. Uh, in the morning peak would be typically when it's at its worst. Um, we know obviously with the pandemic that shifted, but we um, still wanna understand the, the traffic patterns and, and the uh, existing operational efficiency. We also wanted to see what existing modes people within the town of Miami Lakes we're already using to move throughout the town, uh, as well as get an inventory for um, existing transportation infrastructure assets. Uh, that would be things like the meter roads, any bike lanes, um, pedestrian sidewalk gaps, uh, if there were any, uh, as well as existing TDM that the town might already be doing. And this just helps us uh, understand um, uh, you know, our partner and perhaps understand some of their perspectives a little better. So now I'll hand it over to Michael um, for a little bit and he'll go into more detail um, about the town of Miami Lakes. Awesome, thank you, Christina. <clears throat> so how Christina mentioned, we are really excited and grateful about this partnership, right? So the town of Miami Lakes um, adopted a commuter tree production program back in 2013, but it wasn't until now that we are really pushing that forward. So our partnership with South Korea Commuter Services um, started last year. And we are trying to implement strategies townwide that can encourage people to change that behavior towards using other modes of transportation, at least um, when commuting. Next slide, please. To give you like a brief overview from the town of Miami Lakes, we are one of 34 municipalities in Miami-Dade County. So we are in South Florida. Um, we are basically 20 miles far from downtown Miami and approximately 10 miles north of Miami International Airport. We are also 6.4 miles of a square um, size in the town. So we are relatively small and our biggest land use is single residential homes, which encompasses 40%. Next slide, please. Uh, another um, point from the town of Miami Lakes when talking about the demographics, this comes from the census 2010, 
we have around 30,000 30, people living in the town of Emily Lakes, out of which 34% um, percent more or less have a bachelor's degree or higher. Uh, and we have a medium household income of almost 62,000. Uh, and when we evaluate those households, we have around 10,000 within the town boundaries. Next slide, please. So this is like an overview of what I use um, personally to do my assessment when I talk about transportation planning. So here in the town, I am the main point for all aspects of transportation um, that encompasses the planning, the design recommendations to alleviate traffic, TDMs, which is a special initiative that we are also implementing in the town among others. And one of the things that I have been able to see how beneficial it is for our government that I am the one that centralizes all the efforts, meaning connecting TDM strategies and implementation with policy, but also with projects that can reinforce the implementation of those strategies. Next slide, please. So whenever we are um, working on recommending different objectives, I am always trying to make sure that we follow this smart uh, objective. Just because personally, I am a person that whenever I propose something, I like to see that coming to fruition, right? So I not only recommend that, but I make sure to push that through all the phases until that comes alive, of course, if feasible. And whenever we are doing this, I make sure that we are building along the way the partnerships, which are a critical component to implement, but also for the success of the implementation of, of the TDM strategies here in the town. And the, 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 the final outcome that we are trying to aim is basically influence that behavior positively to get people out of their cars and use other modes of transportation, at least when aiming to the individual person, because we have other strategies that are aimed to influence the procedures from the employer side. Next slide, please. Basically, two of the strategies that I focus the most, at least from my end, is um, walking and biking, right? And we know that people perceive um, those experiences differently. So in the town of Miami Lakes, speeding is a huge concern for the population. And if they don't feel safe biking or walking, they would not explore those modes of transportation. So because they have um, identified that as a concern, I started to do an in-house speed management program plan that will address those concerns and find alternatives to mitigate the speeding situations. Next slide, please. Read briefly, um, when I talk about the speed management program plan, I, I divided that between four um, major and primary chapters. And the first one is getting the community's feedback on places that they have identified not safe experiences or um, hotspots and uh, meaning conflict points throughout the town. The, the second chapter will be, will be prioritizing those um, places that they didn't feel um, safe and create hotspots that I will make sure to, to prioritize and at least moving forward to a third chapter. So the third chapter will be evaluating the, the existing conditions and then the tools that we have available to countermeasure those situations in those areas. And the fourth chapter that we have in here will be the implementation phase, which is taking into consideration the budget, the policy, the timeline, and the funding sources. And lastly, which is not in this slide, will be the analytical portion to evaluate the performance measures of those implementation components. Next slide, please. For me, when I, when I started this speed management program plan assessment and, and, and report itself, I evaluated that again, building partnerships is critical for at least my, my job moving forward. And in the same way, this also mentions the tools that I have been using in order to move forward with, with the plan itself. Next slide, please. 
So the first thing is the perception of uh, the, the commuters and, and residents and also people traveling throughout the town, but also the facilities. So in order for people to get out of their cars, at least from my perspective, I, I will need to offer them those facilities to keep working and, and completing that trip, right? So for example, this is, this is a road that is, is within the town of Miami Lakes and the typical sections and are not appealing to the eye of at least a, a, bi a bicyclist or, or a pedestrian, right? So the travel lanes are wide, uh, approximately between 11 and 12 feet wide. The sidewalks are six feet wide and we don't have any shade throughout this road. So has a transportation planning manager here and advocating for safer um, modes of transportation and, and trips, I have been working with the public works department to propose projects moving forward that will address uh, multimodal facilities, uh, kind of like complete streets projects throughout the town to keep encouraging people to, to use other modes of transportation. So. For, for this particular project, we proposed this um, back in 2018, and, and we got the award from, from FDOT, and we are exploring two different options that we have identified within the grant scope in order to, to, to bring those um, facilities into, into the corridor. Next slide, please. The first one is um, contemplating a road diet um, from four travel lanes to two travel lanes and um, leaving the sidewalks in the same space that they are and adding a protected bike lane. In the same way, we are trying to convert this um, corridor into a greenway corridor, bringing landscape for shading and a better experience for the pedestrians and the bicyclists and also the drivers itself, you know. Next, next slide, please. And lastly, this other option basically analyze and contemplate the same doing a road diet, but instead of adding protected bike lanes, um, we are creating the center of the, the corridor itself for a multi-use um, path, allowing pedestrians and bicyclists be protected and completing their trip surrounded by landscaping. Uh, next slide, please. And now I will leave you all with Christina. Thank you, Michael. Um, so as you can see between the two um, kind of pieces of, that I gave before and what Michael just presented, there's a lot of different um, ways that we can implement. Christina, we can't hear you. If you could turn your microphone up. Sorry, I think that I'll just get really close. Um, so as, as you've seen in, in the presentation so far, there's a lot of different ways we can go about approaching um, changing um, perceptions of the streets uh, for the public and implementing TDM. So uh, just wanted to emphasize in this slide here, um, the importance of communicating uh, with your partners and having those conversations early on so that we can identify um, any deviation in the perspectives or um, we can basically identify all of the different viewpoints and approaches to TDM and work through those. Um, we also, um, uh, as far as Miami Lakes, uh, didn't really need to convince them too much of the benefits of TDM as they were already doing it. Um, so sometimes uh, that will also be the case. Understanding uh, and knowledge, uh, so learning as much as you can is also key. So this is where uh, commuters, uh, Computer Assistance Program, SFCS, um, did our due diligence and our research at the beginning and understanding the existing conditions um, in Miami Lakes, uh, you know, so that we could best approach them and understand them in those early conversations about what their needs were and what their um, per per perspective was. Um, as far as developing your skills and not being afraid to ask, so we're all here today. I think we're doing a great job <laughs> of uh, going through and, you know, trying to keep up with trends and, and keep up with the conversation that the industry is having. Um, and some of my favorite resources, just as a plug, are the USF Transportation TDM Digest Listserv um, and the Victoria Transportation Policy Institute Encyclopedia. Um, and also just be intentional when you're building and maintaining your network um, and creating those partnerships. Um, so if you go to the next slide, we will continue um, with 
the next portion of the presentation where we'll get into talking about the employer TDM program um, that we worked with the town of Miami Lakes to develop. Um, so using our understanding of those existing conditions um, for the town and the uh, conversations we had with the town, uh, we did find um, an opportunity here to implement an employer TDM program. Um, so what you're seeing is we, um, and then to do this, essentially we have to now understand commuting patterns to a much higher uh, uh, level. So we also, before we get into um, how we understand commuting patterns more, um, I'll just mention here, we did split this into kind of two parts or phases. Um, first being the town staff survey. Um, and we kind of focused on the town first, um, which is also an employer, uh, along with being a public um, you know, entity. And as it was just a logical starting point. Um, so the town was already a willing partner uh, and it could actually help um, if the town uh, is already implementing or has implemented the employer TDM program, as far as having more buy-in and legitimacy um, with the town's businesses. Uh, and we also saw it as an opportunity for the town to lead by example. Uh, next slide. So in order to understand um, travel patterns and behaviors, uh, we at SFCS um, are very familiar with doing these travel pattern analyses. So it, essentially we use um, uh, big data uh, sources such as Streetlight, and that's basically a GPS data um, that is shared uh, that you can uh, see certain origin and destination pairs. Um, so at the county level, uh, we actually found 88% uh, of the trips coming uh, either within, so originating within the town or leaving the town, um, actually stay within Miami-Dade County. Um, so they're more on the local end of, of a commute as far as that goes. We also wanted to understand intracity travel patterns more. Um, so we identified the hotspots uh, of travel um, and uh, major um, employment centers and within all within the town. Uh, and that information could also be useful in identifying future uh, transit routes uh, or the potential demand for it. We looked at home-based trips and very specifically, and those are the trips um, in the data set that essentially originate in the place of a residence. Um, so in other words, the the those are more likely to be commuter trips, um, or again, the 20% of trip of total trips that Courtney referred to in, in the last presentation or the presentation before the last. Um, and finally, we uh, also did a little more research and understanding the existing traffic conditions. Uh, we wanted to know major access um, entry points and exit points uh, into the town. We wanted to see the uh, truck uh, traffic percentages and get an understanding of the freight movement um, and generally understand uh, level of service, again, efficiency of how the roads are operating. Um, so based on the survey uh, that we did with, with the town and based on the existing conditions and based on this travel pattern analysis, we uh, one of our recommendations is to promote their existing uh, freebie microtransit that they have. So go to the next slide. Um, it's actually the final slide here. Um, we um, we did identify uh, one of the recommendations, like I said. So this would be to promote uh, these existing um, freebie uh, microtransit routes that they had. Uh, there's a, a town-wide uh, route, and uh, it also connects with some of the neighboring municipalities. Um, and there's an, also an additional uh, route that connects down to the Palmetto Metro Rail Station. Uh, in Medley. And that would help just emphasize those transit connections, um, especially for uh, people who might be um, transit dependent. Um, so this photo on the right is just a screenshot of what we, uh, one of the uh, final deliverables that we had, um, which was a video that was promoting all of the transit in the town. Uh, I also just want to mention, um, as one of my final points that we can also consider that we're not just promoting to the existing people who may use this transit in place of their existing commute mode. 
Um, but we're also, um, and what I like, especially like to emphasize to employers uh, is that by promoting reliable forms of transit, uh, there's also a potential to tap into new employee markets. Um, again, I mentioned the transportation dependent populations who utilize transit a lot. Um, it could open up new employment opportunities for them and new employee pools for um, employment centers. Simply by knowing and being aware of these, these routes um, and these connections. Um, so ultimately, uh, social media, um, this is a video we had that we developed, but that's not the only thing we do as uh, the CAP program, as you're all aware. We, we do the traditional media, um, reach out, reaching out to underserved populations, um, outreach events for universities, employers, office parks, anyone who wants them. Uh, and we do provide tri tri transit free passes um, to where you can essentially uh, try any type of transit that we are promoting um, for free and much, much more. And the best part about these resources is that they're already available to the community um, uh, for free. So something that we always try to emphasize and um, you know, maintain in our partnerships. So with that, we can move on to this next slide. <laughs> and move into the question and answer. Thank you, Christina and Mike. Um, I do have a question. Um, do, so were you happy with the results of this, this project? Um, did, did it achieve what you thought you, from the, when, when you started it, did, you, did it achieve it in the end? Well, basically we are in the middle of the implementation right but so far i have been seeing um a great positive feedback so my colleagues here in town hall has been exploring different modes of transportation that they didn't explore in the past and now they are like telling me like weekly oh i will use freebie to go get my lunch or i will walk to get my lunch instead of using their cars so mm -hmm. so far it has been positive but it, it has not yet ended and, and did you, uh, you, you showed us the, the 146th Street or Avenue, um, the, the rendition of what you want to do. Is there any commitment to, to reconstructing the street that way? Well, that, that is an actual project that is ongoing. So right oh, now, okay. next fiscal year, we are going to enter into the design mode and we are going to do a traffic really? study to see if the road diet is feasible. But it's something that we are committed to do. We are committed to bring multimodal facilities to the town. Because it's, it's a shame in South Florida if you can't promote, you know, say, you know, pedestrian and bicycle activities more because it's so flat. You know, it's such an, it, you know, it's not strenuous. It's just dangerous <laughs> yeah. to, to ride your bike. Um, Christina, do, does the South Florida Community Services, do, do they anticipate trying this with any other uh, municipalities in the, in the in their area? Uh, yeah, definitely. We're always open to partnering with other municipalities. Um, we probably already have a couple um, in the works. Uh, and I think uh, we've, we've already done the employer um, survey actually with uh, FDOT. And that was actually our original um, kind of pilot of, of that employer uh, TDM uh, outreach. Julie, do we have any other questions? Uh, no, we do not have any other, any more questions. Okay, well then, um, thank you very much for your presentation and um, we can move on to our next segment. Thank you. Um, our next, our next present, present, presentation will be commuter assistance program research highlights. And we'll highlight recent, recent camp research at Cutter, including the TRIMS model updates and changes to community targeted outreach to promote more use of gamification app and the Tampa Bay Regional TDM plan recommendations. Phil, um, it, Phil Winters is our presenter. Um, if you don't know Phil, then you've been under a rock. So I won't go into any great descri description of Phil, except that he is a graduate from Florida, from Virginia Tech. 
and I have to squeeze this in, a, a little known fact about Phil is that um, for two years at Virginia Tech, he was the body in the hokey mascot costume. And it, it, it triggered all sorts of dreams on his part to move to Disney World and maybe one day uh, be able to work up to portray uh, Goofy. But, but, but those dreams burned down to the ground and, and he has found solace in the TDM world. And for all of us, he is super Phil. So uh, come on, Phil. Thank you, Mike. That was very creative of you. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Yeah, um, as Mike said, I'm going to quickly touch on some of the research that we're doing and or completing uh, in the midst of completing. So next. The first one is our what some of you may be familiar with is our TRIMS model. It's basically a spreadsheet model that predicts the, the societal costs and benefits associated with TDM strategies. So like any good spreadsheet, it's like, what if? What if we did this? What if we subsidized transit by a dollar a trip? What if we provided $5 a day for people who van pool? Uh, what if we gave them closer access to the building and reduced their walk time by 10 minutes? You know, those types of strategies. And then the benefits that it tries to estimate are basically what are the impacts on uh, delay, certainly congestion. Uh, the issue is on the next one is crashes, the value of you reducing vehicle miles of travel and crashes. And then of course, air pollution, energy or gasoline, and then noise pollution, which may be. So all those benefits uh, come back uh, and calculate, help calculate a benefit cost ratio. Next. Uh, it, it comes, while it's a, uh, a model, it also comes with a lot of flexibility built into it. Those that are familiar with it may know that it comes pre-populated with uh, statistics like modes, starting mode split as an example from uh, over 100 metropolitan statistical areas in the country. Uh, there are two types of parameters that we've used. There's regional parameters and global parameters, and you'll see at the bottom of the regional parameters transit elasticities. Uh, previously, it was a global parameter. Now we're trying to customize it for the region. Um, and if you have more specific information for your lo locale uh, or your MSA isn't, possible, uh, isn't present, you can al always override the default values and then go back to the default values uh, if you'd want to in the future. Next. One of the new features that we will be releasing is we've had this issue before where people were like, well, I have the before mode split and I actually have done a survey and I have the after mode split. So I don't need trims to estimate the changes. I've already measured them via survey typically. Um, so we allow you to certainly enter those values in and estimate what those societal benefits are. So if all you have is beginning and end mode split or or beginning mode split and what you hope to be the end mode split, you can estimate that. We also added a, this new feature that allows you to do multiple locations at a single time instead you, so you don't have to run them one, one at a time. And that includes, it can aggregate, all, if you have multiple sites around the country, it can aggregate them all up into a single uh, output. So if you're doing a, you know, a corporate report for your business, you could estimate that. You can also do it at this, obviously at the state level too. So if you have facilities here in Florida and Tampa, Orlando and Tallahassee, you could sum up uh, what are those impacts for all three locations at one time. Same with metropolitan statistical areas. And then also employers. So if you're dealing with multiple employers and some of them may have multiple locations, you can do that. And based on the employer ID, it will group them and give you um, outputs just for the that particular employer at all their locations that are participating. And of course, at, at the lowest level, it disaggregates and shows you what, whichever ones you put in. Next. Um, yeah, I've checked. Go to the next one. I've just kind of explained that. Uh, this is kind of the kind of one of the screenshots just to show that where the data can be overridden and um, and entered in there, and in the compute, then the analysis will override the default values and estimate what the impacts will be. So it's a rather simple spreadsheet to enter things into. Next, all right. The next the next project that we worked on is kind of 
picking on on what's been discussed several of the programs in the state of florida well i think all of them do have have basically a gamification component of it uh, there are three in central florida that district one which is fort lauderdale sarasota uh, district five which includes orlando and daytona and district seven which includes tampa and st pete clearwater um, for those that aren't familiar um, all use uh, Agile Mile, and I think we've heard that. And so what we wanted to try to do is get an idea about, is there something we could learn if we could talk to the users about either how, how the app is working for them or not working for them, how we may stimulate their interest in, in logging trips, or not how we do, but how, how the, each of the caps could do. So you can see some of the questions on the screen that we were trying to get at. So we did, this was more of a qualitative survey, um, qualitative um, interviews. We were gonna do it as a focus group, but for obvious reasons, focus groups have not been uh, acceptable behavior lately. But um, let's go to the next screen, please. So basically we, we took the uh, Agile Ma users from the District 5 program, the Rethink Your Commute program, with, with their knowledge uh, and basically eliminated some duplicates and try to restrict it to those that it had uh, contacted the program since July, 2019. So the big, the big number there is that a little over a thousand resulted in about a sample of potential thousand users. Now we weren't gonna be interviewing a thousand individually, but those were the ones we targeted with an email several times to ask them if they would fill out a brief questionnaire and then also indicate uh, if they'd be willing to um, conduct an in-depth interview uh, with us, which would be a, basically a one-on-one -on -one, um, Teams or Zoom call. Next. Uh, this is kind of some of the statistics that were reported. We had about 50 respondents overall uh, to the actual survey. So yes, it's, it's not a high response rate, um, but it's fairly typical, I think, of what you can expect nowadays. Uh, we did incentivize those people that agreed to complete the survey, um, not only complete the survey, but also participate in the online surveys, gave them a, to a basically a Starbucks coupon um, that, uh, that you have under your chair, according to Mike. Um, basically, but at the very bottom, I just, I will point out that despite our efforts in our, the commitment of probably over a dozen people or so, um, that had agreed to the online interview, only four actually went through with it. So take the, the following results as kind of a, with a grain of salt, but um, it gives you, it might give you a sense. I don't think we walked away with thinking that they were atypical basically on what we were hearing. Next. A uh, couple of the major findings that they expressed the issue of uh, what we, what I labeled as at, app fatigue. You know, the idea of logging trips, even though it's it, the program is designed very easily to use and to log multiple trips in advance and things like that, the people are just like over time that it just kind of the novelty wore off. Uh, they certainly saw value in commute alternatives, which you would expect. I mean, they are customers of Rethink Your Commute. Um, the second was, uh, which I don't know, we hadn't necessarily anticipated, but it was uh, no room for an app. Uh, a couple indicated like um, I've got an app involved. I got an I got a, a phone with apps on it, but I have already too many more apps. I don't want another app. I will access it via the internet via my phone, but I will be enter, entering the web portal version, not the app version. So it would get us to be a little bit more sensitive when we're trying to recruit people that maybe just not focusing on downloading the app may not be the only solution. You may need to offer that there's a web solution for those people that don't want to, don't want to use the app. And of course, people are concerned with what apps might do on their phone, especially if you're talking about transportation and tracking. Another, uh, I'd say, finding that came out was what we call rewards scrolling. There are literally, I think, about 4,000 or so different uh, rewards available to the individuals and as while that was very helpful for them, um, sometimes it was very fine, hard to find what rewards were available to them very locally. 
So um, I think um, Agile Miles considering some enhancements or uh, that might make it a little bit easier. So it get it easier to find and redeem the rewards. But uh, those are among the findings. Next, um, there were several that they were willing to reach out to other commuters. We did see people that would had reached out to multiple people. So they didn't seem to be hesitant, but there were of course some that never considered it and never made the connection of what the app might be able to do for them. Um, others are what we called one and done. They initially matched up with someone in their area, but they never went back to see if there were any new people that have been added since the first time they checked or the only time they checked. Uh, or in the case of some of the folks that were working different shifts or different changed jobs or whatever, they didn't necessarily go back to change their profile or recognize that they're, you know, maybe they're on the, you know, first shift this week, this, this month and second shift next month, uh, that they, they might benefit from having, um, more than one profile that make it available. And finally, that would allow them to accommodate multiple schedules. Next. And yeah, again, I've kind of said that some preferred the website over the app. Um, three out of the four users stated they did not, use, again, it's just only four users, didn't state, or three out of the four users stated they did not use the website or app to find someone to share the ride. Uh, and several of them were uh, existing transit users, for example, so they didn't find the need to look for, a, say, a carpool or a van pool. Next. Um, these are the suggestions, including you might be doing things like identifying suggested routes. I think that goes with Courtney's comment earlier about cut, like customized transit maps, uh, same with bike routes, um, and make it a little bit easier for them to enter information on a recurring basis. Next. And finally, to um, talk a little bit about the Commuter Assistance Program Regional Development Plan for District 7, which is Tampa Bay, which is the, what kind of the map shown. One thing we noticed in doing, looking at a lot of these plans that we're very good at mapping transit routes and highway improvements and bike paths and sidewalks even on maps, but there's little representation of what some of the traditional TDM strategies are. Um, what you're seeing on the map with the help of Commute by Enterprise, we asked if they could generate a map that would show the origins and destinations of their van pools. So it's kind of a, it's hard to see on that map for probably for many of you, but there's several stars, including McDill Air Force Base and a couple of the VA hospitals in the area where the vans go to. And then what the colored dots represent is which location they go to. But it gives a representation of what van pool means. And we think that this could be important of trying to represent uh, TDM and some of these other long range plans. Next, uh, basically it was to develop a, a regional development plan for the Tampa Bay area. Many transit agencies have what they often call transit development plans, but there's nothing for TDM. Now there, um, this was not intended, well, at least didn't turn out to be specific project related like you might get in a TDP. Um, this was like, how could we, how could the region better support what TDM could do both on a policy and an investment strategy? Uh, in particular, we wanted to not make it redundant for the several different types of transit uh, plans that are being developed in the region. So we wanted to make sure what we were doing was supportive of the vision for these plans. Next. Um, we came up with some guiding principles. Again, we, we wanted to figure out, focus on optimizing the existing transportation system, um, intensify the high interaction outreach and the high touch customer service, because we recognize that high tech by itself won't solve all the problems. For example, you could have an app, but if and you can get people to download it, but if they don't set up their profile and use it, it doesn't do you much good. So it, it's going to take some hand holding and uh, high touch customer service. We want to provide certainly more choices to improve mobility. Um, as pointed out earlier, there, there, earlier, there's a large share of the population that does not drive. Either they care not to, or they're too young to, or or um, 
or no longer needed to drive to work. So the recognizing that there's a big portion of people that are not being served be just because they choose not to, or yeah, basically they choose not to drive. Um, and this of course means taking a customer service, um, customer first approach with a focus on the individual experience, not just the system-wide benefits such as reducing congestion, it's getting down to what do they need to solve their needs. Um, next. Uh, prioritize service for existing customers. Uh, as we find in our research before that being a satisfied customer is more likely to increase word of mouth endorsements. So if you're focused on the existing customers, or I guess as Courtney Pick pointed out, they were riding transit to save money to get a car type of deal. Um, yeah, if you're paying attention to existing customers, you might be able to reduce the churn, if you will build upon effective programs and services that are already in place now and not just create new new things. Everything is like incentivized new and, you know, new creative technology. It's, it's a bright and shiny. It doesn't always uh, replace the, basically the elbow grease that makes it, ha it happen for so many people. We, we certainly believe in the philosophy of incentivize, don't necessarily penalize though, the, that may be uh, differences of opinion among uh, on some, uh, whether you're requiring people to have a transit benefit ordinance, for example, that some cities have done for those, especially those areas that are offering parking subsidies to their employees, uh, that might be a form of incentivization. Um, and employers certainly, as we, we all know, have more control over travel choices and we tend to think that in the planning process, they are often not considered um, they have particular needs. If they if they will not allow their employees to say a, adjust their work schedule to accommodate transit service schedules, then there's no ex should be no expectation that their employees are going to be able to use transit if they can't adjust their schedule accordingly. Next. And so I'll just I'll, I'm going to interest the time because I know we have a full thing, but. We have a list of main recommendations. Basically, that the ones I've got on the screen are focused more on the statewide recommendations, and that includes setting up a district a district wide policy. We recommend not just for District Seven, but for others about how the commuter assistance program uh, will fit the Florida Transportation Plan 2045 and subsequent um, ones. Establish performance targets so we know what we're sh shooting for, so we can match resources to expectations. And uh, of course, at the bottom, name telework is a vital um, transportation strategy in the Florida transportation plan. Uh, telework is more than just a you know a work a work strategy. It actually can contribute to uh, peak hour congestion. Okay. Um, and then the, we think that it should be actually roles for more of the commuter assistance programs in some of the planning efforts. Uh, maybe uh, relinquishing some con uh, control over this congestion mitigation air quality funds to enable greater flexibility that are used in most parts of the country. CMAC can be used for TDM. Uh, it's not traditionally used that way here in Florida. And we think that should be reconsidered. And finally, develop a statewide commuter assistance program plan, which I think the procedures is a start in that way, I would expect, or a part of that. Other research in progress, um, we're working on a business benefits calculator like TRIMS, but to help estimate the benefits for employers like in, in changes in productivity, reductions in overhead. Uh, we, several of you are familiar, we're starting a neural, neural marketing evaluation of TDM marketing materials in, in conjunction with a center here on camp, our campus here at University of South Florida. We're also starting the pilot of a vehicle occupancy detection of, of on managed lanes using an app called Ride Flag uh, that uses an app and taking photos to count how many bodies are in, how many people, sorry, how many people are in each vehicle. So that would allow people to use form spontaneous carpools and val validate that they have a sufficient number of people to qualify for either discounts or preferential treatment in some other way. And then another one that's um, a more, uh, academic, which is the social uh, carpooling based road construction mitigation uh, one. Uh, basically, it's 
using some data from Texas to estimate what on-demand um, carpooling might uh, result in. With that, I think that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Phil. I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I could listen to Phil talk about trims all day long. <laughs> and um, <laughs> um, I, in the interest of time, we will forego questions, but you all know where to find Phil if you have any questions on any of these projects. And um, now we move to the award ceremony, the Travel Choice Award Ceremony. Um, the the F Florida Travel Choice Awards recognize excellence in Flor Florida's public transportation and are awarded in three categories. The first one is Innovation Award category. And um, it's given to a system program or organization that um, has designed or implemented specific public transportation related programs that demonstrate innovative concepts or effective problem solving techniques. The program, <clears throat> the program should be of proven value and useful to everyone. And to this year's award goes to Car Free St. Pete. Yay! Hey, um, Car Free St. Pete. Through the Car Free St. Pete, we they promote information on how to use the alternative transportation available to the public in downtown St. Pete. Through their website, social media, and before the pandemic, at in-person tabling events. This information includes where and how to access the bike share as well as safe routes to bike. They organized an event through Car Free St. Pete in September of 2019 called the World Car Free Weekend, where almost 20 local businesses offered discounts or promotions to customers that arrived car free in celebration of World Car Free Day on September 22nd. And also in 2019, they held the first car free scavenger hunt through the Car Free St. Pete to facilitate a fun way for the public to learn how to use alternative transportation to get around down the downtown area. Uh, this year, they organized the Car Free St. Pete Committee, which is made up of 12 diverse individuals from around the community to direct and help with the efforts in the Car Free St. Pete initiative. For more information, tune into the carfreestpete.com. Our next category is marketing excellence, Re recognizing excellence in Florida public transportation related marketing, including advertising campaigns, electronic media, print media, and special events. This year's award goes to Manatee County Joint Outreach Plan. Yay! Um, the crowds are cheering uncontrollably. In most cases, the regional commuter assistance programs are tied to FDOT districts to not overlap service areas. One exception is Manatee County that is served by the District 1 Commute Connector Program, but also falls within Tabarda's jurisdiction. Tabarda, the Trans Tampa Bay Area Rapid Transit Authority, also manages a commuter assistance program that does not necessarily that does not include Manatee, but there is a joint effort there. While the cab services do not overlap, they have created room for confusion, that has created room for confusion with Manatee County and created a marketing opportunity for both Tabarda and Commute, Connect, Commute Connector. A marketing plan was implemented in the 2021 fiscal year that included a jointly created stakeholder document strategically conducting joint outreach as appropriate and the creation of the first Manatee County Earth Day Transportation Fair, that's a mouthful, and Green Year Commute Week this past July. And the final one is the Leadership Award category, honoring a Florida individual who has made outstanding contributions to, to the public transportation in industry. And the award goes to Diane Poitras from Florida DOT District 5. Diane was nominated for the 2021 Travel Choices Leadership Award based on her years of service to the department and dedication to the District 5 Regional Commute Assistance Program. Under her guidance, District 5 launched a regional program in 2010, navigating a difficult transition away from the separate transit agencies 
in transit agency led programs to form rethink your commute. Her steady leadership and reliability have been the pillars on which the program was able to grow and develop over the past 12 years. Beyond the Rethink program, Diane served as an important part of District 5 team supporting SunRail, providing oversight and guidance on topics ranging from funding, safety, and compliance requirements. Diane has trained many new members of the Modal Development Office, sharing her expertise with the next generation, so the department will somehow survive without her when she retires later this year. Say no, Diane. Say no. And with that, we have our Travel Choice Awards. And as I said, I can barely hear because the crowds are just cheering tremendously. And our final th um, issue here is the Florida Commute Choice Certificate Program. And this year's, oh, it says here, free, it's free to full-time Florida residents, comprehensive course of study, learn from experienced instructors, network with other transportation professionals, explore important issues, it's a weekly one hour webinar. Um, I think it's at, during your lunchtime. Earn a certificate with 80 credits and it goes from March until September. Um, and I, I encourage everyone to, 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 to um, participate. We have three, three graduates this year. First is George Clark from the Transportation Demand Management Specialist with the Tri-County Council for Governance. I guess I can't see here. For Southern Maryland. For Southern Maryland. This program, um, I can't see that. Um, manager for the Virginia Department of, wait, what? Oh, it's Catherine Moline. Catherine Moline, oh yes, I know her. Um, and she's, she's our second graduate. And our third graduate is John O'Keefe, account executive with Ride Finders, which John told us that Phil, was the founder of in Ride Finders in Richmond, Virginia. And congratulations to all of you for completing this program. It's, I hope you found it useful and you talk it up to other people in, in your area. Anything to say, yeah. Phil? Yeah, congratulations to all three of you. It's been a pleasure having you and um, I hope to see more of the people that are attending here sign up for the classes back when we start them back up in March. We start our social marketing and transportation certificate tomorrow. Wow. So um, uh, we'll do that one through March and then we'll pick up on the commuter choices again. So again, congratulations, George, Kathy, and John. And I just wanna remind everyone that for Florida residents, these two certificate programs, the commuter choice certificate program and the social marketing and transportation program are free for you as, as part of the virtual of ones are. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, um, and, and for the uh, out-of-staters, um, there's a nominal fee. So, um, but still very useful. And, and also it's, it's also, it's free speaking of best workplaces for commuters. Mm -hmm. It's also the uh, best workplaces for commuters are eligible for a free seat in the classes as well. Okay. And, and also the best workplaces for commuters is free for Florida businesses since the Florida DOT is uh, underwriting the, the, the program through Cutter, um, we, we, we provide for the, the free membership in the, in, the, in the best workplace for commuters. So all you caps out there, find ways with Julie to, to utilize the best workplaces for commuters program to incentivize um, um, corporations and, and, and employers in, in, your, in your service area. So. Do we have anything else to add, Julie? Um, no, I think that's it. Uh, just congrats to all the BWC members, all of the Commuter Assistance Program uh, representatives have been really great to work with. And we saw a big increase, as Phil said, with the BWC <laughs> membership. So again, thanks everyone and great job for working on best workplaces for commuters and all of you who are on across the nation too. We have some other uh, BWC supporters in the audience. And I guess that brings us to the end of our, of our uh, virtual summit, and, right? There's nothing else on the, on the market, on the, on the... That is the end. That is the yeah. end. Hopefully, hopefully yeah. next year we'll be able to 
to um, provide a face-to-face -face meeting. And if we do, you know, pandemic allowing, um, we'll probably go back to our original plan of two years ago to do it in um, Gainesville, Florida. So um, we will keep you posted on what is going on with that. So the eva evaluation was will open. Or yes. Be sent? Yeah. Okay. The evaluation will open, or you will be sent one tomorrow to complete for both days. Okay, and that you, if you're in the commuter choice certificate certificate program, you get credit for doing it, right? Yes. Yes. So you earn, earn credit. <clears throat> So all of you get in there and fill out your evaluations. <laughs> and even if you're not, fill out your evaluations so we want to know, we want to have some feedback. So, okay. Thank you, Mike. Thank you all. Yes, great job, everyone. Great job, Mike. And great job to all our presenters on a really good program this year. The recording will be available soon. <laughs>